You're listening to the Deep Purple Podcast, a fan podcast about one of the most legendary bands of all time, Deep Purple. We take a look at the music, history, and people behind the band Deep Purple and beyond. Welcome to the Deep Purple Podcast, the first and only podcast devoted to one of the greatest bands in rock history, Deep Purple. Today's episode is episode number 61, The Roundtable, What If Scenarios, and coming to you from the supremely flooded suburbs of Chicago, I'm your host, Nathan Beaudry. And coming to you from the suburbs of Providence, your co-host, John Flying Horse Matola. <laughs> He just took the thunder right out. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and coming to you from the temporarily dark streets of Las Vegas, Scott Milkbar Haskin. Milkbar. <laughs> All right. I like that. So, okay. Well, who's, who's John, what, what's a flying horse? So flying horse in keeping with my Rhode Island facts is the refers to the flying horse carousel, which is the nation's oldest carousel which is located in Rhode Island. Where? Is it the Warwick Mall or something? Um, (laughs) No. (laughs) Actually, I was thinking that no. So that was a good guess. Uh, No, the uh, the town of Watch Hill, which is South County. Oh, interesting. More on that later. Um, But our guest this week is none other than Scott Haskin. Scott, welcome to the show. Welcome back. Thank you. Thanks guys well, for having me on. It's great. Oh, thank you for thank you for coming on the show. And Scott sure. has a podcast of his own that has been going for years now. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it's, it? Uh, it is the Haskin Cast podcast, which you guys were uh, guests on. One we episode, were. Which we we'll have to do that again. You were. It was great. One yeah, of my what, favorites, actually. What was Thanks. that back in November or something? Uh, yeah, somewhere around there, I think. Yeah, right. it's it's all a blur to me now. <laughs> Pre, it was pre-COVID, so it could have been anything. <laughs> yeah, the whole world has changed, and I don't even know where I am anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I just I interview different people uh, in the entertainment industry, from actors to musicians to people that are behind the scenes, and uh, just kind of uh, dig into what goes on and hopefully help people appreciate art on a, from a different angle or a different level. Excellent. So we are and, thrilled to have you on this week. Yeah. Thank you. And I just realized that I welcomed you back, even though we were on your <laughs> podcast. So, um, I, <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> yeah. I was like, "Yeah, welcome back." You were, we were never here before. <laughs> no, but you know, it's it's just another get together for us. Yeah. And it's it's kind of like when a waitress says, "Enjoy your meal," and you're like, "You too." Just <laughs> yes. out of that, you know. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, so, so why are the streets dark in Las Vegas? Just is everything? Well, are they have they actually turned the signs off? They, uh, the, a lot of the outside lights are back on now, but uh, you, nobody's home. So it's kind of uh, a little bit haunting. And uh, all the slot machines in the entire city are off. So if they, you know, they have them in grocery stores and gas stations and the airport, uh, everything is dark right now. So mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's just a little weird. I took a drive down the strip uh, about a month or so ago, and it's just so bizarre watching nobody walking around and being there. It's, wow. it's just haunting. It's really weird. Remember, we lived in uh, New York during Hurricane Sandy and driving around lower Manhattan uh, with no power, no street lights was really freaky and yeah. kind of terrifying, kind of like a post-apocalyptic scene. That's the term I've been using. It feels very dystopian and post-apocalyptic and uh, it's, I stop it. Well, hopefully the streets will be lit again and the sounds of, uh, of change shooting out of slot machines will fill the fill the air no doubt about that <laughs> so what's your so um uh, i guess before we get it get into it i just wanted to say that we're trying something a little different this week and and we're having a, a round table discussion so we put it out on social media to get questions from all of you we've got tons of good questions and we're just going to see how it goes a kind of a kind of a running theme of the questions is a lot of what if scenarios uh so we're going to tackle mostly that but probably some other uh, auxiliary questions as well Hmm. um yeah we were getting uh getting a little getting a little burnt out on the the um the cycle of album reviews and video reviews and stuff so we thought a round table with uh with a guest host would be uh kind of fun and a nice break 
right? You guys are getting very creative too with the, with the different types of episodes. And I, I love every week that I just never really know what to expect. It's a fun mystery. <laughs> it's a mystery to us too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this, and this week was great because I didn't have to do any prep. I just, uh, all the listeners did the prep for me. So thank you. That's true. I just yeah, had to copy everybody. and paste some tweets into an, into a document <laughs> here. Um, so before we get started, I uh, just want to say there's a few ways you can support the show. One is to leave us a five-star review on Apple podcasts. And another is to become a patron on Patreon for as little as $1 a month. You can help support the show, support finance future episodes or books i don't have any around right now but books on deep purple albums whatever it might be so that we can bring you more content and then speaking of our patrons at the 15 dollars tier we have of course steve seaborg of name on anything.com and all the worlds of stage.net at the turn it up to 11 dollars tier we have ryan m and hey oh a new turn it up to 11 tier member and that's alan Begg. Ain't too proud to beg. Thank you, Alan. Really appreciate <laughs> you supporting the show. Uh, that's great. Just came in hot out of the gate. Boom, $11. Um, All right. The $10 no one came tier is still named as such. It is, it's vacant at the moment. So you can make it all your own if you want to come in on the $10 patron level. At the $5 money lender tier, we have Clay Wambacher, Greg CLB, Frank Tealgard, Mortensen, and Mike Knowles. At the $3 Nobody's Perfect tier, Peter Gardot, Ian DeRosier, Mark Roback, and Anton Glaving. And at the $1 Made Up Name tier, Els Murders, Spacey Noodles, The Ghastly and Freakish Leaky Mausoleum, and Michael Vader. Thank you very much. Uh, we would also like to just note that if you do not like Patreon, which people said they didn't, and then they were liars because everyone seems to like it, we also have PayPal available. Recurring payments or single one-time payments are available. And, and how many of those our... payments have you gotten, Nate? Um, so far, uh, <laughs> we've gotten, gotten a big goose egg. <laughs> Every, everyone loves patience. Uh, wise, wise people advise me, you got to have PayPal, man. A lot of people don't like Patreon. Okay. Know. So, yeah, I was like, oh, man, once I open PayPal, the gates are going to be open. The money is just going to start rolling in. It hasn't changed anything yet. <laughs> um, and then uh, thanks to our brothers at the Deep Dive Podcast Network, Riot Sabbath, Bloody Podcast, The Simple Man is Skinner Reconsidered, and Terry T-Bone Mathley, T-Bone's Prime Cuts, and, of course, patron saint and archivist of the Deep Purple Podcast, Jorg Planer. Thank you for your support. Um, just a couple things this week before we get into the main meat of the episode. I uh, got a really nice email from a uh, listener, Chris, uh, says, I've just been listening to your episode of Made in Japan by Dream Theater. I was so impressed uh, by it that I had to find a copy. My wife, Dawn, scoured the net, bless her. Uh, actually, his email comes in with his wife's uh, name on it, so I think he's using her email too. <laughs> and he found me a new copy on eBay in Canada. I can't believe how good it is. Uh, when you consider it as my favorite live album of all time, the fact that they stay faithful to the album is a testament to the fact that they are fans and what great musicians they are. I thought I knew a bit about Purple until I heard what Jorg Planer comes up with. The guy is an encyclopedia on Purple. Love the podcast. I'm learning something new every episode. Cheers, Chris. That's awesome. Nice. Thanks, Chris. If I, if I could just interject really quick, Please. I want to point out that I thought I was very well-versed on Deep Purple until you two came into my life and told me that I know nothing. <laughs> Hopefully we didn't literally say that. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was felt. <laughs> it's just like no, I, I've, I've learned a ton uh, from you guys, and I really thought I was pretty well versed. I mean, I used to know the, the record number of every album, of every pressing and all that stuff. And uh, of course, I'm old now, so I've forgotten it. But uh, I, I've learned a ton from this show. Well, thank you. Well, um, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I appreciate it. I, I think there's a lot of, anytime I post anything, I'm reminded how little that we know <laughs> because there's a, a lot of fans out there that have a little bit probably more um fluency in everything deep purple but. i mean there's there's all different levels of fandom though you know some people know the 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 pressing numbers on each record and you know like i don't know that stuff but some other people might know other things you know so it's um yeah like richie blackmore probably doesn't know the pressing number on any of those but he can play the songs pretty well or how many not, people but... are in his band or <laughs> <laughs> but does he know where the concerto score is? <laughs> it remains to be seen. He might. I have my theories. <laughs> um, then we had another great comment. Um, 
on YouTube. So it was on our, it must've been our butterfly ball movie episode, Pittsburgh rocks, uh, who has been really active on YouTube lately. Thank you. Um, wrote about our, we were commenting on the guy that looks like Jimmy page. Like who's the guy that looks like Jimmy page. Uh, and he says, the guy who looks like Jimmy page is none other than Mark Nozif, who we are all familiar with. So I didn't realize he looked so much like Jimmy page. Hmm. A, a long-standing, you know. Here it is. This will this uh, this episode will come out in late June, and we're just learning, our, uh, solving a mystery from back in November. So, thank you, Pittsburgh <laughs> nice. Rocks. We appreciate that. All right. So, should we get into some of these questions from our from our listeners? Yeah, let's do it. All right. First one up is, uh, and you're gonna have to excuse me. Some of these are hard to pronounce. Uh, Oe dude. Tw- 2013 on Twitter. Hypothetical question. What if Richie Blackmore didn't leave after Stormbringer album and tour? What would the future have been? How long could Mark III have gone? And would Rainbow have ever existed? That's a tough one. Do you want to start, John? So what if what if Richie didn't leave after Stormbringer? Oh, he just continues to, to stay with the funk band that he loves. <laughs> You would have kept making that shoe shine music. <laughs> um, I would, man, it, it's it's tough because I feel like Richie, like, uh, w- like lost control of the band. You know what I mean? Like he was, it was almost like he was, he knew that he didn't have control anymore. So he's like, bye. And then he, you know, decided to t- <laughs> dominate Elf, you know, and take them over. <laughs> but um, I, let, let's just say for the sake of argument, like I'd say he probably like get, get the power back in deep purple. And I, I think that, um, yeah, he might've, he might've gotten rid of like, uh, Glenn Hughes Mm. and maybe got in a different bass player because I mean, if that's the, just to simplify it, I mean, if, if he really, if, if they were getting too damn funky, you know, and, and Glenn Hughes was also the, the wild card, he was out of control. My guess is that he would probably like, I would think that he would, they would, get another bass player, maybe try and get Roger Glover back since he was working with him in a, like a year or two later anyway, and probably try and get back to making the type of music that Rainbow was making or progress on to that. And then, I don't know, I feel like knowing Richie, like it wouldn't have lasted too long. I think he would he might've like done come, some version of Come Taste the Band and then like started Rainbow a year or two later than he did. Yeah. I would agree with that. I, I think that um, uh, the one thing that I've, I've always found interesting is that when they were going to do the concerto, uh, Richie apparently had told John Lord, look, I'll, I'll do this, but I want to do a rock album. And if the rock album doesn't work out, I'll play with orchestras for the rest of my life. When they did Stormbringer and he thought it was too bluesy, it seems to me that it was always interesting that he never said, look, guys, we need to get back to rock and roll. Let's just get back to making another heavy album like Burn and see what happens. But I think by that time he was just tired of it and he wanted something completely fresh that he didn't have to worry about what other people were doing. So I agree, I think if he would have stayed for another album, I think eventually he just would have left after another album. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think the thing that worked with the concerto with that philosophy was that the the lineup was still so new that there there were more things to do. And with this one, this would have been an ancient 18-month-old lineup, which in Richie terms would, would have been unacceptable. So he probably would have um, been more likely to cast them aside. I like the idea of the new, a new bass player. Just It would be kind of in his fashion to, to bring in Glenn Hughes specifically to have more harmonies and all that sort of stuff. And then after two albums, just be like, ah, get rid of this guy and go, <laughs> yeah. and go with, uh, like you said, I don't know if, I, I'm sure there was a ton of, British session players around that time that could have jumped in um, at a moment's notice. Uh, it'd be interesting to see who it could have been. I well, I mean, I would, if I would pick anyone, I would say probably uh, I would have gone after maybe Gary Thane uh, from Uriah Heap. Mm. Hmm. That could have been interesting. And, and then, but when, I mean, go ahead. Uh, to Scott's point um, as well, um, Richie. Um, like stuck around for the concerto, but I think that what you guys were saying before too, like Nate, you were saying it was 
uh, like a brand new band, uh, like a brand new lineup, but they were also a brand new band. Like he, I think he was still trying to make it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You, because I mean, they had three albums out, but I mean, that was in, what was that in the span of like 18 months or something? And they didn't really break that big. Mm-hmm. And so they were still just kind of fl- like, he hadn't gotten tired. He, it, Deep Purple didn't give him enough time yet to get tired of them. <laughs> yeah. Or for him yeah. to get tired. I mean, um, so um Another thing is that he could have he could have done the since the singer and bass player seem to seem to be interchangeable there. Maybe he got rid of Coverdale and Hughes and brought brought back Roger Glover and maybe Ronnie James Dio. Anyway, that would have been mm-hmm. interesting to have him be part of Deep Purple. Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, because I could I could see Coverdale as long as Coverdale was still okay writing writing about fantasy sort of things, still sticking around. I think he was. I mean, he was uh, the the end of the end of the the lineup, like that last concert. Like, you know, him and Ian Pace and John Lord were just fed up with the other guys. I mean, he would have kept doing it because he, he was heartbroken when they mm-hmm. um, when they decided to break up. So, I mean, I think he would have stuck it out. Yeah, I agree. All right. Well, I mean, and as far as Rainbow ever having existed, I think a lot of the hypotheticals and some more of them will pop up. If they're about Richie, I think it it has to assume, you have to assume that Richie's still Richie. So if it's like, oh, what if Deep Purple didn't break up at this time? I was like, well, they probably would have broken up, I don't know, six months later. (laughs) Like how much, (laughs) how much more could you possibly have pushed it, pushed Richie to be, uh, content with whatever was going on and i think the only you're only ever right. just kicking the can down the road with with any of those hypotheticals yeah and, and the bigger question to, to tack on to that would be what would the quality have been if he was disinterested and just like all right i'll do one more album you've talked me into it fine you yeah. know what would the quality of the music have been uh, in the writing and the performance it would uh, yeah <laughs> or That's or like come taste your come taste the band with richie only using a screwdriver a slide um still waiting on that album yeah so i think like a hypothetical would be like what if richie loved working with established lineups then maybe some different things could (laughs) right like yeah if yeah if there was if there was a question saying like what if richie's personality was not richie's personality (laughs) what if it was different then we could go into other hypotheticals but (laughs) there'd be a lot of (laughs) A lot of things. Rod Evans would still be in the band. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sky's the limit. All right. Next up, Laura, our old friend Laura Shenton asks, oh. out of any lineup, what's the dream team when you're allowed to mix and match? Ooh. Ooh. So I guess for, uh, we, you know, if, if you, I guess we should uh, put the caveat there of like, you can't just say, well, Mark three or whatever. You'd have to say. I was gonna- <laughs> <laughs> there'd have to be some mixing and matching actually going on so like oh let's boy. say the first mark marks one through four let, let's mix and match and make a dream lineup john what do you think all right so we're only gonna yeah i mean since i'm only like really familiar with the classic mark lineups um not the kind of like post like like um ian gillen's second coming ones like you know after 93 when like uh i'm sorry um richie when he left in 93 and then they got joe satriani and steve morris and all the other people filling in like i don't really know those that well so if we're sticking with the classic lineups um boy that's tough um well i mean you have to assume that like like uh ian pace and john lord are, are there the whole time because they were the only ones that were constants so i would say um or you can you can go uh, outside of it if you want you can go yeah i mean but i mean ian, I, uh, I guess ian pace is a lock <laughs> he, he's yeah. like the middle the middle bingo spot he's yeah, just an automatic yeah. like you get him <laughs> automatic but I, I would, but I would keep ian pace and john lord uh coverdale on vocals and Roger Glover on bass. Mm. And then that's I, like cover, Coverdale being the sole vocalist. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm, I would go with uh, Ian Pace and John Lord. And, and if, we're gonna, if we are picking Mark 1 through 4, then that would be uh, a given anyway. But I would have picked them. Uh, and then I would say I'd like to see Nick Simper stay on bass 
Roger Glover producing. Ooh. Right. And I'd like uh, Ian and David both to be in the band switching off songs and then maybe singing like a, a blues together. Hmm. I like that. I wanna, I'm trying to think. Maybe I'll just go for like a completely oddball oddball arrangement. I'll go obviously Ian Pace. I'm going to go Don Airy on keys. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with Rod. Rod on vocals. Tommy Bolin on guitar. And Glenn Hughes is only playing bass, no singing. He would never do that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but it's his scenario. He can make it up. <laughs> that's true. Wow, that's um that's a that's some bold choices there. Now I feel silly. I'm just doing it just to be <laughs> just to be bold. Like I mean, obviously I want to hear Glenn Hughes sing, but I was just like, oh, it's me. Well, he did do that one album. Was it like a Satriani album where he just played bass? I think he might have as like a session player, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. I think, but it was a recent, like it was within the last five years yeah. or so. It is like the first mm-hmm. time he's only played bass on an album. Mm-hmm. Um, the second part of Laura Shenton's question is what's your favorite other band to come from the Deep Purple family tree? Mm-hmm. A lot to choose from. Um, God, my favorite. Well, I mean, right now I'd have to say Captain Beyond. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's that's, the, that's a tough one because uh, there's been so many. I think I'm probably closest to either Rainbow or White Snake. Um, in in the moment, uh, I'll pick White Snake. But if you ask me again in five minutes, it could be Rainbow. <laughs> well, that's what we're gonna say. Like, who's your who's your favorite? Like today, the tomorrow or five minutes could be a different. Yeah. Yeah. Nate? Yeah, that is that is a tough one. I mean, I I think talking like early output, like early white snake would would be hard to beat and if you're talking about something like a little bit more in the more extended family tree meaning not having a direct connection to Mm -hmm. deep purple i might go with something like fancy like i I really really dig their whole groove and everything or even hard stuff for that matter it's interesting because i found purple through rainbow uh, I was a fan of Rainbow, and then when they did their concert, they did Smoke on the Water. I'm like, hey, what's this song? Uh, that's how, that's where I was at the time. Yeah. And um, so that's how, I, so it would seem like Rainbow would be the band for me, but, uh, you know, uh, I've been kind of listening to White Snake a little bit more lately, so I, I'll go with White Snake. Awesome. All right. Conrad C. Steves on Twitter writes, um, Oh, this one. This is a tough one uh, because I don't. I don't know what it is. What happened to the Sonic? <laughs> what happened to the Sonic Zoom CD series, which released the live Deep Purple recordings? I was hoping for more rarities to come to light, and I don't know that I have. Oh, the uh, I know what they're talking about. I don't know what happened to them. Uh, typically, the argument tends to go over who owns the rights of the recording, and who owns the right to broadcast it. Uh, I. I know that the, I think it was the Deep Purple Appreciation Society was working on it, but I haven't heard anything in quite some time on it. Oh, I see. They're the ones that did the, like the H-bomb, but the official one, the Space Volume 1 and 2 mm-hmm. was part of that series I'm seeing. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. We don't, we're not privy to that kind of information. But yeah, would, I, I'm not in the know on that. But it would be good to see uh, some more information or more releases coming from that series. Uh, Robert Ponser on Facebook says Deep Purple is considered. You hear that? <laughs> sounds what like is that? Kids. It sounds like my children are not asleep. Uh, um, <laughs> Deep Purple is considered one of the unholy trinity of British heavy metal, along with Zeppelin and Sabbath. I'm 38 and live in the U.S., but it doesn't seem that Purple's popularity has carried over to younger generations under 50 the way it has with Zepp and Sabbath. I think the multi-decade delay in Hall of Fame recognition is related to this. Why has Purple not retained relevance with younger U.S. audiences? Is their sound more dated? I've heard people point to the Hammond organ sound, for instance. Furthermore, there seems to be a much stronger present-day fan base for Purple internationally than in the U.S. I couldn't agree more as, a, as an American Deep Purple fan. Mm. What do you guys think? Um... um um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say because I, I don't think that the, the sound is, I mean, if you, if you 
think about like Mark One and even the first couple of Mark Two albums. Yeah, that sounds dated. But I mean, I guess if you're talking about the whole Hammond organ uh, kind of almost um, uh, what kind of um, what kind of uh, music uh, are they um, usually classified as? I'm I'm at a hard, loss hard right rock. Now. I think no, not like a hard like um, um, like a pro, what's a is it progressive? progressive rock or um mm-hmm. what's the i'm, like I'm kind of losing the term yeah like a, yeah like a kind of a proto prog rock type of band uh but definitely more accessible but maybe um you know they were just never really as commercial um as, and i don't think they tried to be either but it's just something that like you know it's, it's kind of like maybe a british or european sound that didn't really resonate as much with americans uh because i mean you remember the the um the, the episode we're listening to i mean say you're just talking about richie and even some of the sounds that he uh, and like the the choices that he made in rainbow when he was trying to be commercial was just like he threw in this kind of neoclassical stuff and then it sounded like <laughs> yeah. you know poppy and keyboardy and you're like this is just far out there you know mm-hmm. it's like really weird choices for somebody to be making that's trying to be like quote unquote commercial so i think that there's just something in there that probably only appeals to just you know really niche market maybe but um you know i i think they've always been okay with that and uh, you know haven't tried to change it so what do you think scott i I guess it would depend on what they're basing that on i mean if they're basing it on radio playability or or video playability that's not something that they've really cared about that much uh, when I go to a show, anytime I've seen them, that theater, big or small, is packed. And it's with people of all ages. So I imagine that there's a perception for British bands, especially anybody who's considered classic, and all you hear on the radio or in commercials are songs like Highway to Star or Smoke in the Water, or maybe Child in Time, uh, that you would have that perception. But I can say, honestly, from the shows that I've been to and the interviews that I've heard with the band, They've got people from, you know, 16 up to 70 and 80. Uh, anybody who's vertical is going to go. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure that I have that same perception only based on that interaction and what I've seen. But if you look at the commercial world, yeah, they're not on TV. They're not, you don't hear them on the radio a lot. So I, I could see where that would come from. I think it comes from, honestly, something we talked about a lot on the show, just poor management and, mm-hmm. and marketing likely. Um, you know, Black Sabbath and, and Ozzy, more importantly, has had, you know, this huge marketing juggernaut behind him. And um, I, it, it's always, it always kind of ha- did b- baffle me at first because music wise, they're, they're so great. I don't know that the Hammond organ, I don't, I don't know that most people would be able to even pick out that Hammond organ as being like a, you know, a church organ or anything because of the, mm-hmm. you know, the, distortion and everything that's on it and it sounds damn heavy as far as i'm concerned um but yeah I, it's growing up in the states you know you just I, i'd say most most people they're always put on that same level as led zeppelin and black sabbath like internationally mm-hmm. but in the united states i don't think the average person in the street they're going to be able to name they could probably rattle off or recognize a couple of zeppelin and sabbath songs Deep Purple, outside of Smoke on the Water, and maybe Hush and Highway Star, there's going to be very little, I think, that they would know or recognize. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's probably true. And and if you think about the difference between, say, the 70s and now, in 72, they did four American tours. So uh, at least at that time, they were very, very prevalent here. Uh, now we're just part of the circuit. So they, they spend as much time here as they need to, just like they do in the 52 countries or so that they hit in a year. So uh, it, it's, it's really, uh, I imagine, just the time of how much time they have to spend versus how much do they really need to promote. You know, uh, Infinite was uh, a top 10 album in a lot of countries. So mm-hmm. do they need to throw a lot of money into promotion to gain new fans? Probably not. Right, and they're probably not making a huge margin on those album sales anyway, they're, and they're getting a lot more from the tour. Sure, yeah. And I mean, are we, we're talking about like where, where Deep Purple is at currently or just historically are we I guess, kind I guess of talking kind about of, like their whole kind career of because i mean yeah i mean the, it's one of those bands that everyone's heard of deep purple yeah. but not everyone could 
tell you much about them or even you'd, you'd say smoke on the water and they'd say oh it's the same it's that band okay right i mean they're clearly the they're respected and you know revered by everybody in the uh, uh most people in like the rock and metal community everybody loves them but if we're talking about the average um you know joe schmo that doesn't cite them as an influence or any of that kind of stuff like i, I would put them up there with you know sabbath and led zeppelin even though i don't listen as much to Led Zeppelin. They're not as much to my taste. You know, I would say, you know, they're, but I mean, my perception is different though, because I mean, I, I, we were, we were like what, 15 or 16 and in love with Deep Purple. So there's always mm. going to be people that, that were. So um, I don't know. I don't know how popular they are or not. Um, we don't like, we don't have the actual numbers to back it up. I think we're just kind of, I'm guessing. And I, I bet if it, it, going with the theme of quizzing an average person on the street, I bet the average person on the street, there's probably a 70, well, there's probably a 90% chance that they know who Ozzy is, maybe even closer to 100. But yeah. who is in all three of those bands, who is the next individual that someone would be able to recognize? Are they going to even know Tony Iommi, Ian Gillen? Are they, nobody, I don't think people for the most part, I think it, would, it drops below 50%. After Ozzy, and I don't know who the next person would be. It'd be an interesting poll to do. That would be, I, but see, that's it. You know, you bite off the head of a bat in your early career, and you're set for life. That's all you got to do. Exactly. Yeah, it's I would a, say Ozzy would probably be the yeah the the most. I mean, if you're talking about quizzing just anybody in the street, I would say yeah, because if you if you were talking to like another rock fan, then you would say after Ozzy, I would I would guess maybe Jimmy Page. Yeah, or, I would say Ronnie James Dio. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, it's a tough one. And yeah. and and even Ozzy, if you go back twenty five years, it, it might be another shrug because he he hadn't had his show, and you know Sharon hadn't gone completely mainstream and overboard with you know her own brand as well as hers as well as his. So mm-hmm. that's a tough one, though. Mm. All right, Mary Deep. Perkspole. It's a deep purple, but an X instead of a U. Deep Perkspole. <laughs> That's a tough one to pronounce. Uh, this is a hard one, and I, I actually did do a little research to try to figure this These out, but I don't know. Hard ones. Give me an easy one, will you? <laughs> <laughs> how do you feel about smoke on the water? No. Do you know how Richie got, scar- got the scar on his mouth? Always wanted to know, but never found answers. He has a scar in his mouth? Yeah, that was kind of my first reaction. But I'm thinking, he has a scar in his mouth? I think it's like a little scar like on his lip. Huh. Um, yeah. So did you did your research turn anything up? No, I think I think a direct uh a direct tweet to Candace is probably the only way to answer that question. Hmm. I, that's interesting. I, I'm going to guess that it had something to do with his guitar being thrown somewhere in a concert. Mm, that's a very good guess. Yeah, he was very physical uh, mm-hmm. player, so that that definitely could have been it. Yeah, I'm doing some. I'm doing some, like a quick Google search to try. He to never like played guitar with his teeth like Hendrix style, did he? Uh, I don't think so. Did. He played it with his ass. I saw that. <laughs> did a, pretty much every. <laughs> he other did do a lot. He like he would just like toss it up in the air, or, like toss it around like a rag doll. So it's possible he just like kind of like you know banged himself in the face a couple of times and maybe cut his lip open or. Okay, I'm kind of... Watch it be something like he tripped over a llama or something. (laughs) (laughs) It would be like non-guitar related. (laughs) Right. It's like I went to get a pan of can of beans out of the pantry and like, you know, hit my face on the kitchen cabinet. Oh, that's boring. (laughs) Anyway. So here we go. Here's a picture of Richie. And I I guess you can kind of make out the the scar. Let me just throw this up on the screen for you. Um, so you see like on the bottom right, like, I don't know if they're talking about that little, it almost looks like a dimple underneath his chin or there's like a little mark above his, on his upper lip. Hmm. Yeah, I'm looking at that. I think it's like the, the Indiana Jones thing where he hits the whip at the snakes and he, he cuts himself, or the lion and he cuts himself on the lip. Yeah. I, I'm going to say in rock and roll fashion, it was a piece of his amp that blew at him when they blew it up at California Jam. Mm. Oh, that's good. Well, I, you know, I, I do see another picture of him. It looks like more machine head era where that is not the case. So, ah. so it, it looks like it, it, it looks like he might have a, um, it might be a more recent thing. 
See, all those years of paying, uh, watching Scooby-Doo have paid off for you. <laughs> exactly. Oh, here we go. Here's, a, here's, a, here's another theory we might have here. Let's, let's see if this picture gets you any. So maybe it was maybe maybe he had too much ad <laughs> adhesive on his fake mustache when he tore it off. Is that from the Outlaws? No, it's from um. You know, I think it's. It was it like Gillen's wedding or something. <laughs> they wow, I've never seen that. There's the a hell? bunch of photos from this photo shoot. There's photos of Ian. I think it's Ian Gillen's wedding. Mm -hmm. There's Gillen dressed up like they're they're doing archery, and Gillen is dressed up like a. You know, his him and his wife are dressed up like noble people, and wow. So yeah, there's 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 a whole. If you do like a little search for that, it's just like the entire band is dressed like Ren Fair. It's pretty great. Hmm. Maybe that's I what I've seen. Yeah, I've seen pictures from that shoot before. I didn't recognize that one, but yeah. Maybe that's where Richie got his little taste of the of the the Renaissance fair life. Could be. Okay, so next up, Braden eleven thirty. On Instagram, who is named 1130, by the way, because his birthday is November 30th, same day as mm -hmm. Roger Glover's. How about that? We had a nice. little chat about that. Um, he says, could you discuss what if scenarios if Richie left the band instead of Roger Glover? So this would be going back to like 73. Ooh. Richie Ooh. decides to leave Glover. Glover stays. So now you've got to replace Gillen and... So the who would Glover, Lord, and Pace have selected to replace Richie and Ian? So well, that, raises, that raises a big question, though, because if if Richie left, would you have to replace Ian, or would he come back? Hmm. Well, it sounded like Ian was kind of disgusted with management, um, mm -hmm. but may, maybe he would have been a sweeter deal to him to stay if if he knew Richie was leaving. Yeah. It raises a lot of questions. So wait a minute. So who in this in this question, who's who's still in the band? So it would be Pace, Lord, and Glover. They need a new singer and a new guitar player. Okay. So singer, I mean, I wonder if if I mean well, it would be interesting if if they did do the kind of singer search again and and still somehow ended up with Coverdale. <laughs> yeah. That's true. But, you know, uh, I think the real key uh, initially would be the guitar player, because that's going to be in rock, you know, who your primary writer is, is, is your guitarist. So that would really be the key to what would happen going forward, because that's going to shape a lot of the band's sound, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who would who would have been floating around in 73 that could have and would have fit in with Deep Purple? Um, well, the first the first one that comes to mind for me, obviously, is um, Albert Lee. Because mm. he said, because, I mean, remember when we were listening to the Green Bullfrog CD, we couldn't tell some of their solos apart. <laughs> that would be interesting. Um, yeah. They had a very similar kind of style. Um, and maybe, um, and then we have to find a vocalist too, right? Mm -hmm. maybe, would it be, wouldn't it be funny if Paul Rogers, they got Paul Rogers. I was going to say, I was going to say maybe Paul Rogers. That would be, yeah. that would, that would still be very like kind of Mark two ish. Rich, Rich, Richie would be so pissed. <laughs> <laughs> but that would well, make for, sense, you know, because it wouldn't be going in that kind of bluesy slash funky direction. It would kind of be staying more rock and, and proggy, I think. Yeah. What do you think? I'd like to see Ray Fenwick give it a shot. Mm. I think that could have been interesting. Uh, I don't think Tommy Boland would have been the choice because I don't think he was well known enough yet. Mm. Yeah, and I don't know an that. Extra year or two. Yeah. So I don't think he would have been on their radar. So I'm going to go with Ray Fenwick. And for vocals, God, that is such a tough one because there were some really good singers, but everybody I can think of was pretty much tied up in a band at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess Deep Purple would have had the clout to be able to to woo someone away from their yeah, band. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe That's if they true. were wooing somebody away, who do you think they could they could woo? I'm going to go to the Uriah Heapwell again. I'm going to say John Wenton. I think John Wenton would have been an interesting choice for Purple. I don't know that he really would have had the range to do it, but I think he might have been a good person to, to give it a go. Mm-hmm. Mm. I was thinking John Lawton myself. Oh, John Lawton, yeah, another good choice. 
or I wonder if, you know, their close relationship with Dio, if Dio would have considered it or if that would have been enough of a, of a draw to, to get him away from Elf. Well, what's the timeline on that though? Because didn't they meet during Mark IV? No, I think Elf was supporting them as early as 72. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then Dio would have been a potentially good choice for sure. And lots of good choices. The guitar, yeah. the guitar player is is the tricky one. I, I like. I, of course, I'm I'm a fan of the Ray Fenwick. Uh, mm-hmm. Of course. Um, another another interesting one is like if, um, given the kind of heavier direction they went in, and knowing that he sounded that great with Captain Beyond, if Rod returned. Oh. Mm-hmm. Wow. Rod comes back. And like, does like picture Rod in? mark ii like heaviness maybe rod, rod and rhino come back together as a pair just kind of like a gill and glover sort of thing he'll be mm. like i come i'll come if if rhino can come with me there you go that'd be interesting with that oh, yeah. with that new heavier sound mm. oh yeah because rhino is a great guitar player too he was no nonsense i, I love his guitar playing yeah I just pictured rod evans coming in on a giant wrecking ball and just jumping down onto the stage <laughs> and singing hush I want to see that now. All right, here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Rod. <laughs> like, I, I don't know if I have any other creative kind of like thoughts for other people that, you know, outside of Deep Purple that could have fit the bill. Yeah. Well, I like Funny, none of, us said, none of us said Jimmy Page. Mm. I, 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 do, I think they would have had a hard time prying him away from Zeppelin. Yeah. I don't think his style would have fit anyway, though. I think he yeah. was too acoustic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, um, Richie did a little bit of acoustic here and there, but it, it was kind of sparing. Yeah. Uh, he did it sparingly. He was more like uh, like a rocker mm-hmm. um, in, in purple. Um, and plus, it was like really like well-known, too. I mean, the, the, whole, the whole thing with Tommy Boland wouldn't have worked that early anyways, because didn't he come into the band because Coverdale had heard him on the, the Spectrum album, mm-hmm. which I think came out that year anyway. So in that scenario, Coverdale would have had to have been in the band. Yeah, I think Cover, Coverdale right. was the main driving force behind that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. But, yeah, An interesting question. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I, I, I like that. I like that one a lot. Food for thought. Um, Norin uh norin norman weichelbaum i hope i pronounced that correctly on facebook uh who's quite active uh, i like that you could say weichelbaum and not norman i know <laughs> uh, Martin, good job nate what's a strange <laughs> first name i've never heard before <laughs> uh, says here's a tricky this is um more like a, a, a an actual question, not a hypothetical, but here's a tricky one. Do you have any idea how Deep Purple is set up as a company? Who are the right holders in trademark? Uh, do former guys like Richie still uh, participate in the ongoing Deep Purple performances? So I only know a little bit about how they're set up. And I know I've heard in interviews with Coverdale, how he talks about, um, and even with John Lord, actually, when in the interim, in the, in the late seventies, talking about how, even though, the band wasn't together. They still had to have this kind of business relationship and, and keep in touch and talk about certain things. So I, I know it's, I know that there still was even a management presence, even though the band didn't exist. And I know that they still like Coverdale's people and Blackmore's people will have to talk about certain things. And, but other than that, I don't have too much info on how the company is set up. I don't know what you guys know. I know nothing. <laughs> well, that's correct. Uh, I just know that was it a few years ago there was a big lawsuit over the fact that uh, somebody had stolen a bunch of their money. Uh so whoever however they set it up didn't work. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's right their their accountant kind of ran away with a few million, right? Yeah. But uh, but when it comes to certain decisions like anything that they do have control over and I'm guessing they actually don't anymore. But uh I remember when uh, there was a Burger King campaign that had used smoke on the water as their uh, smoke on the Whopper advertisement. And I asked Roger <laughs> really? uh, how he felt about that. And he says, well, we don't really have a choice in any of that anyway. Uh, because right. Because the publishers are the ones that decide those kind of things. But there may be certain things when it comes to releases 
or mm -hmm. uh, alternate versions or video releases that they may have to discuss. But uh, I would imagine that it's more, more their lawyers that uh, handle all that stuff than them directly anyway. Smoke on the Whopper. I need to see this commercial now. <laughs> Smoke yeah, on it was, the Whopper. Yeah, it was, it was, it made me sad. <laughs> yeah, it's, oh, it's hard, it's hard to see something like that and feel good. <laughs> it, it is, yeah. But. Um, oh man, that's terrible. <laughs> well, as. It was, yeah. <laughs> as John, John Lord said, you know, the, the song Smoke on the Water is good for a, a six figure check, check for him every year. Just that one song. So maybe uh, that takes a little bit of the. That dulls a little the bit of the pain out of it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they used yeah. it in the. Oh, here's my six-figure residual. <laughs> Never mind. Carry well, you can't on. Get away from it. I mean, you go to a hockey game, and at least ten times during that hockey game, you'll hear smoke on the water. It's it's everywhere after all these years. And for people that complain about being tired of it, it sure does get a lot of play still. <laughs> I know, right? I've I've had my fill, but there you go. Same. Um. Uh, our good friend Jim Massa on Twitter says, and he can hit you every, anywhere. He's on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. He's all over the place. Um, he asks, what if Purple got Paul Rogers to be vocalist after Gillen? How would Purple's musical direction have changed? And does Richie stay in Purple and thus no rainbow? Hmm. Uh, I always thought Paul Rogers was an interesting choice because as much as I love the sound of his voice, and uh, the band that he did with Jimmy Page, The Firm, I really loved their stuff. I don't, I don't see him singing purple songs, though. I never really have. I can't imagine him singing Highway Star or Space Truckin'. Uh, I love his voice, but he doesn't really have that range, at least not as far as I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how well that would have really worked. Much like Jimmy Page joining as the guitar player because he does so much acoustic work, I don't really know how Paul would have fit in with purple. I never really got that connection. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess it would have been no different than, say, Coverdale trying to sing high, a Highway Star or whatever, where it would, you know, he could do it. I'm sure he could, but it, but it doesn't have that. It, it, it just maybe does. It loses you a little. I'd be more interested in seeing what music they would have created with him moving mm -hmm. forward, rather than trying to imagine him sing the older songs. Because I, I was never crazy about Mark Three doing Mark Two anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. I give it two albums and Richie would have quit and form Rainbow anyway. Rainbow's happening, people. It's just going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's like, what if no Rainbow? It's like, no, there's always going to be Rainbow. Yeah. Um, but I think with the Richie's uh, classical influences, I don't know if Paul Rogers' voice would have fit in because I don't see him as, as kind of a, that kind of vocalist. Like, yeah, Richie can get bluesy, he can get funky, but at heart, he always throws in those weird Phrygian scales and stuff like that. Like he's going to, he's going to do something that I don't know, maybe it would sound good, but it's just like, I don't, I don't hear Paul Rogers mesh, meshing with that. I can just imagine like Paul Rogers bringing this, Oh, I got this song I wrote. It's called bad company. And just hearing Richie put down these like, okay, we're going to break into a fugue and, you know, <laughs> after the, after the second verse. <laughs> I just and don't, let me add let me add my blistering guitar solo over this <laughs> exactly it just i, I I'm, I'm hearing it in my head and i'm laughing <laughs> <laughs> well he was he was a light rock singer that's kind of how i look at, at paul rogers is yeah he sang a lot of light rock and i just don't see him fitting in with like a hard driving band mm -hmm. and i just i think i definitely don't ever want to hear him sing burn <laughs> I kind of do now. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, think not it, as it's... hard and progressive as and and kind of like you know uh, aggressive as Deep Purple got. Yeah. Yeah. I, I with 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 Rogers. I think I think there's no mistake in the fact that Richie always seems to come up with a virtual unknown to join his band, whether it's vocals or anything for that matter. Um, I, once once somebody you know david coverdale joins the band he's a nobody and within a couple of years he's david coverdale like actually not even a couple of years like within six months he's this huge charismatic figure and now you get you get and you start to learn about his songwriting process and all that and you could see him butting heads with richie and i think with somebody like rogers it would have just been it wouldn't have been like Coverdale who was just probably at first like, Oh my God, I can't believe I landed this best behavior, whatever they want. I'm going to do. 
Paul Rogers is going to come in and be like, this is my band. And Blackmore is going to say, well, this is my band. And I don't even know if they'd make it to the first album from what I've heard of Rogers anyway. And then he formed Rainbow. (laughs) (laughs) I think he'll always, the answer to every one of these questions will be, and then he formed Rainbow, but it it just happened uh, two two months later. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Um, Art Smith drums on Twitter writes what if they'd taken some time off after machine head tour um and hadn't been forced into yet another album for at least a year i i feel that's kind of a easy question um i think mark two would have stayed together for longer because a lot of what caused tension in the band was that that cycle of um, writing, recording, touring, writing, recording, touring, and, and just, you know, the, that grueling pace that they had to keep. I mean, we talked about it like really early on, like by the time they were at, who do we think we are? That's why that album sucked so bad was it because they just had enough of each other. Sorry. Yeah. I, I think that's the big, <laughs> now I listened to that episode. Uh, I, I, uh, I think that is the biggest the biggest problem and one of the biggest problems in the history of rock and roll is that the pressure that was put on these guys was just way too much. I'm sure that they would have had little tiffs and things, but I don't think they would have escalated to the point that they did had they not been under that constant, I can't stand being around you, can I just have five minutes to myself kind of world. I mean, the, the pressure was just inhuman. And it's really sad that the record companies didn't understand that that machine could have produced for a much longer period of time instead of just let's hurry up and make the money before it burns out. Uh, but then I'm grateful it worked out the way it did because then obviously Hughes and Coverdale did come along and we got some mm-hmm. great music uh, from, from them. So uh, it, it would be interesting to have seen what kind of music would have come from it. But uh, yeah, unfortunately it unfolded the way it did. Yep, it's a, another classic, you know, goose that laid the golden egg sort of scenario. They just, yeah. they, unfortunately. Um, mm-hmm. Simon Berglund on Instagram writes, what is a, this is a good one. What is a track list for a hypothetical second Mark II album taking songs from the solo projects? Oh, that's a tough, I almost feel like I have to get all my albums out and spread them out, but. (laughs) Like um, if Deep Purple were, the Mark II version of Deep Purple were to redo songs from all their solo projects. So yeah, so we've kind of touched on this a little bit in the past, but I guess it's like if you take White Snake, Play Me Out, Malice in Wonderland, uh, Private Eyes. Oh boy. And just put, put those all on the table. What would that second Mark what what would some of those songs from the from those albums been to make a mark for album and we've like i said we've touched on it slightly in the past but i think you could put a really good mark for album together with those some of those tracks so so we're talking about just everybody that was in mark four uh correct only like a kind of a, a post come taste the band album mm-hmm. hmm. oh well, what wasn't there? Which song was it on North Winds that uh, that they were yes. rehearsing with Tommy Bowen? They never was. It wasn't uh, Time It Again, was it? Uh, no, it was. Well, uh, what's the? Or was it Keep On Giving Me Love? It. it I don't. I don't think it was that. Was that the dinner, dinner, do, 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 the one that's got oh, that. Uh, only my only soul. my soul. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's <laughs> the one they rehearsed together, but I could see that riff. I could see Tommy Bowen playing that in a heartbeat. Oh yeah. That's tough. I think that might be that, that might be one of those uh, we have to prepare for it questions because I don't. I mean, that might have to be one of its its own episode almost. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that's a great question though. But, but I mean, we could definitely. I mean, we've talked about it too. Like you said, we could take songs off of those albums and probably make up a track listing. They've, they've had similar. Uh, kind of questions on um, on uh, Kiss podcasts, like uh, which is much easier. Which is if you took the best of all the four solo albums to make up like another Kiss album, what would it be? Um, so mm-hmm. this is very similar to that, except you're choosing from like a wider pool. And I don't know the songs as well. I could see like like uh, Blind Man and uh, um, that song on, on Play Me Out. Uh, I think it's about time. The one that's yeah. kind of like that. And it's, then it kind of goes into that uh, more like laid back sort of 
guitar thing i can see that song working really well um a ghost story from malice in wonderland but more of you know with you know, kind of what you had said about malice in wonderland at the time if coverdale was singing this imagine what it would be like so um yeah there's there's a lot i mean there's a lot of really good stuff and then going to you know a post toasty or a sweet burgundy or something like that there there's so many tracks that could the, I, think I would the say tr- like savannah woman might be would be an interesting deep purple one. Oh if, yeah if, they so get if, it. if you pick from pace ashton and lord does that count as two um yeah i mean i, I guess it would be because <laughs> i guess they, they didn't really have anything immediate other than that together right so yeah. but yeah I, I think you'd have trouble narrowing it down like doing a greatest hits of those four or five albums or six albums almost with if you take the two Tommy Bolin albums, the two Coverdale albums, Glenn Hughes's solo album, mm-hmm. and then Malice in Wonderland. Wow. Well well they gotta do space. But oh yeah the, space the, high the, the question though is that when you're looking at it, it wouldn't be just like what songs do I like the best from this album? It would be what songs would be mm-hmm. good Fit the best yeah. sounding from Deep Purple creating it uh, right. a version of it. Like what would they be good at doing? And then also, like, who would sing them? Like, if so, would something come off of, like, Hughes's solo album where you're like, that would be neat if Coverdale, like, harmonized with him here or took a verse or Tommy Bolin or something, not just, like, <laughs> take the track as it is. What are you thinking? No, of? I'm just Cover- thinking of Coverdale singing some Coverdale Hughes song. Space like, Welcome to Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> Coverdale doing the L.A. cutoff. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Los Angeles, darlings. <laughs> But that's what I mean. Like you'd have to picture how would how would purple do it, and then right. pick pick it from that. Well, I think that that's uh, really kind of a good pool of songs to uh, choose from because if you think if they went one step past "Come Taste the Band," they would probably be in let's say seventy seven or seventy eight, and mm-hmm. then we probably have a really uh, kind of late seventies, almost like disco y production. So I think that a lot of that stuff like would have been really cool because I think it would have gotten like uh, it would have gotten funkier and kind of like a little a little slick and a little more out there because they were already starting to get a little out there with um come taste the band, even though like it was it was um generally like a really hard rock album still, but I think they could have gotten like a really experimental. Mm-hmm. Like we might have got, we might have been this this closer to disco purple. Wow, <laughs> purple disco. We don't know. We Deep don't disco. know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Stephen Somerville on YouTube writes: Here's my question to you, which is a very interesting topic to know as well. This involves Richie and David Coverdale during the '80s. Oh yeah, this is a good one. Um, Rainbow were doing a show and the promoter had invited David Coverdale to come backstage in which David was really uncomfortable with, thinking that there would be trouble involved. Uh, Now you're thinking David and Richie had never had any sort of uh, beef. Well, here's the meaning and truth behind it. During uh, between 1980 to 83, Whitesnake and Rainbow were topping the charts nonstop with outstanding rock music and were uh, were rivaling a wee bit in terms of numbers of fans. Um, David loved it because he knew it would get Richie's get at Richie's nerves. So when David was backstage at Rainbow Show, he could sense something weird happening by smelling something he knew before in the past during the Purple years. And then out of nowhere, he got jumped on the back by a certain guitarist he knew from Deep Purple, saying, "Get out now, or else I'll be thrown out." 100% certain that's Richie, in which they argued for a long period of time in front of people who were also backstage as wives, groupies, managers, and fans who had VIP access. Um, uh, so that's a story I wanted to share with you, and hopefully you can use this as a Q&A on the video. So um, kind of a story uh, more so about this meeting between, which I can play for you guys. I forgot to kind of pull So that up. really happened? Yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. and here's, uh, I can put oh. Coverdale talking about it. Let me just... Uh, let me drag the screen over for you guys. We'll have a little bit of a listen to Coverdale recounting the tale, because obviously, Richie, I don't think wants to talk about it. <laughs> All right, here we go. As David Coverdale and White Snake became more successful, a rivalry developed between the band and Richie Blackmore's Rainbow. Trouble always coming my way. If they can get to number six, we'll try and get to five. 
can sell out the Hammersmith Odeon quicker than they can or whatever. And it was a, there was a lot of that going down. And I think David loved it because you know, he knew it would get up Richie's nose. This rivalry came to a head in Munich after a rainbow concert. The promoter made the enormous mistake of inviting me backstage. I said, are you sure it's OK? Because there'd been bad blood between Ricardo and I for some time. I got a call from Cozy saying, look, Something's happened tonight, it's nothing to do with me. You know, it's between them. If they want to play kids, that's up to them. Small corridor, it's packed, and suddenly I went, I know that smell. <laughs> and the next thing, he's grabbed the back of my neck and the hair or whatever. He's going, you, and you can get out. Fortunately, I got a swing round and stuff, and everybody was like, oh, no, what do we do? Interfere with Richie Blackmore and David Coverdale having a fight. Trouble always coming my way, sort of thing. Nice, perfect sound to that. Good choice of song, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you know what? I, I believe that I've seen that that um that clip before. So now it's coming back to me. Yeah, it's part um, of a longer documentary. Yeah. But so what is the what was the the was there a question surrounding was, that or was it just kind of bringing it up? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there was a question. I, I think he was just commenting on it, but uh, I, I remember hearing that interview and thinking, I, I never really heard what the beef was between those two. I mean, I could get the healthy competition, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I have to think it must have started when maybe when Richie left Purple, and because I know that David looked at him as kind of a mentor. Mm -hmm. And maybe he was disappointed that Richie left and that that just kind of started or, you know, they stopped talking at that point. But something was obviously going on more than just a healthy competition. Um, there had to be something else that was fueling that kind of animosity between the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's just one of those things. Sometimes you stop talking to somebody and then all of a sudden a year goes by and you're like, ah, screw that guy. <laughs> and then you don't even really know why. <laughs> It could be other people feeding you things. And I'm sure that because there had to be, like we talked about earlier, this sort of business connection there, then they, they might have had some sort of vague communication that just didn't go well because they weren't having it face to face. Because I think they left on, or Richie had left on fairly good terms, but over time it probably just changed. I love that he calls him Ricardo. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, know, I, I, cheeky, he's like Ricardo. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's almost like wink did you get what i said there uh but i remember uh when when white snake was on rockline it was cozy pal and david coverdale so it had to have been for the slide it in album and uh i remember that bob coburn asked if he was going to to uh, be contributing anything to the new deep purple lineup because that was when the the new uh, perfect strangers was being put together and he said only only the odd turtle or laugh so i think <laughs> he had at that time in his life at least a lot of animosity now mm -hmm. he uh, bernie marston quoted Co cozy but i don't know if that was when cozy was playing for white snake or rainbow at that oh, show. Yeah. i don't know when that was <laughs> that's right well he says 80 right. to 83 so it would have been it would have been a uh, rainbow i guess uh Although, didn't Co cozy left in 81 yeah. didn't he yeah well, it was 80 to 83 so Oh, okay. Well, Cozy, so was, on, Cozy I could have, was on Slide It In. So, so it could have been either. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that was 84. Mm -hmm. so, so I guess I guess we'll never know. Kind of, I, I find it weird that like, Blackmore would just jump Coverdale. Ah! Like, just start grabbing his hair. Like. Well, I mean, you know, he also, his idea of a practical joke was like setting people's bed on fire and breaking <laughs> into their room with an axe. So, I mean, you know. Maybe he was playing a practical joke. I know, a great practical joke. I'm going to punch David Coverdale in the face. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. <laughs> I got you so good. All right. My, my favorite, and I think it was Tony Ashton that he did it too when he, they were, Tony Ashton came to stay at Clearwell Castle. So they, they moved the bed and dug up the floor and put a speaker in there and then put the floor back on. And they were just like playing haunted sounds into the floorboard so that he would freak out thinking the castle was haunted. Well, now that's oh. a prank. That's a good yeah, one. At least, yeah, that's a little bit less violent. It's a lot. Yeah, that's not a little... smashing someone's door in with an axe or anything. Oh. Uh. Good old Richie Prankmore. Uh, <laughs> um, so Ian DeRosier on Twitter writes, OK, Deep Purple Pod, what's the story with John's Hammond? It looks like he's been sawed off or something, and there's something, uh, there seems to be woody things to reinforce it. Was this tale ever told in the podcast? I totally forgot about it. 
So there is a picture, which I think he posted, but of course I'm, I don't know if I'm able to find it on the fly because I didn't get it in advance. Um, I got a so complacent with the fact cannon? that the, all these questions were done for me that I was like, I don't need to do anything to prepare. <laughs> I, I forgot something. But yeah, Oops. so there's, if you look on uh, John's Hammond organ on the side of it, 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 it looks like it's been sawed off and then like reattached. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with, let me see Oregon, see if I can pick up a quick picture of it. Um, yeah, I saw that post when, when Ian posted it. And uh, I, I don't know if it, what the specific story was with it, but I think you were right because you had responded that uh, you thought that that was the one that he bought from Christine McVie from Fleetwood Mac. Mm-hmm. I think that that is. So I don't know if that was something that happened when she owned it or or if that happened when he owned it. Yeah, so I found a picture, and I think um, the answer, I think, is, uh, let me just, oops. I think the answer is that it was something that, I think it did happen when Christine McVie owned it. From what I understand is it, or, no, you know what, it might have been John Lord. So from what I, oh God, this is a terrible picture. Um, <laughs> so here you go. It's a, little, it's a little pixelated here, but you'll get the point. So basically you've got, it looks like it was cut and then made shorter. And mm-hmm. I, th- I think what had happened, I, I don't know if it was John Lord that did it. I can't remember exactly, but I think they cut it off and then made it shorter because John, because basically it was up too high. So John just wanted it to be shorter. I think that's mm-hmm. the, Could have been. the quick answer. That would make sense. And the other thing that I was thinking was because he would rock the keyboard back and forth. And if it's mm-hmm. not at the right height, then he's either going to push it over or not move it. Yeah. And, and if it was too top heavy and he pushed it back, it might not, <laughs> he might lose it. Right. I wonder, exactly. if he ever, I wonder if he ever did any gigs where he lost control of it and just like, just bang hit the floor. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I would have laughed my ass off. That would have been well, well, and those things that you, the wires attached to that to that back side of it. So if it went down, it would have crushed the cables. Yeah, it would Yikes. not be good. I wonder if he had anything right. to to re like anything to reinforce it to the stage so that it didn't get to that point. Well, as as we know. learn as we learned in our interview with Don Airy, um, it the, this organ came to an unfortunate end. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Was that the one that he bought from John? Yeah, apparently uh, John just gave it to him. Was just like ah, just take like or just like he just was had had it. I guess he just wanted to get get, <laughs> get out, and he just gave it to Don. So Don was actually using John's organ for uh, uh, up until I forgot what year he said it would when it finally died, but it was fairly recent, twenty thirteen or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and it finally just kind of fell off the, it was after John had passed, but it, it, it <laughs> fell coming out of a truck. It just fell off the truck and just, oh. Don, Don said, uh, he, they, he still has it. It's in storage. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> He's, he'll fix it up someday, I guess. Ah, well, plus who knows what Christine McVie did with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Probably was, had already taken some abuse. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still yeah. funny to me to think that Fleetwood Mac when they were just a blues band opened for deep purple, like that just, it seems like such a strange bill. Yeah. Right. I would, when I first saw purple on the perfect strangers tour, girl school was opening for them, which was an equally strange bill. Yeah. That is weird. Yeah. So here's it was a long <laughs> half an hour. I'll just say that. <laughs> so here's what, um, actually we got a response. So the cut down B3 was probably suggested to, uh, Christine by others in the band. They wanted to. Uh, they wanted her to stand out more as the band became more famous. So starting with the Rumors tour, she had a B3 that was recased into a smaller, sleeker black carrier, and she cut out the mostly unnecessary ARP synthesizer, the one, uh, the one that blocks her in so obstructively on the Landover MD. 1975 video. The ARP was allegedly there only for Sunny Side of Heaven. Uh, uh, interesting too that Chris played a C3 rather than a B3 in earlier years. So yeah, I guess it was just mm. they cut out part of it and just reattached it together to get rid of that ARP. Yeah, so, there you go. So there you have it. Once again, did. another mystery solved on the Deep Purple podcast. Yes, thanks to somebody that's not a, even us. <laughs> um, 
Bravo Delta on Twitter writes, if Tommy Bolin would have lived on, what kind of music would the band have produced? This is assuming that Tommy Bolin would also have stuck with Deep Purple. So, so this is, I guess, going to a, a second Mark IV album and beyond. Mm-hmm. And I think it needs to be stated that there would have to also be some sort of lifestyle change, I think, between Bolin and Hughes to have made this possible because it doesn't sound like that what was going on towards the end of mark four would have been sustainable so if they had either had their addictions under control or had overcome them what could have possibly happened well i i definitely feel that there could have been another great mark four album i mean coming off of come taste the band i i, I would have been chopping at the bit at the time to know what mm. would have been next Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it would have been another great rock and roll album, but you're right. I, the biggest factor in that being a reality would have been the reason that it didn't happen was because of the addictions. Mm-hmm. And what? So, so the, the, the type of, I think the type of music would have gone in the way that, that I was predicting if, you know, Purple, had, and I think I'd said it before too, if they had made an album in like, 77 78 even 79 it would have it uh, maybe one or two more albums would have gotten still been rock but maybe would have been a little more had a little more of like that um kind of funky or pop late 70s um edge to it i guess you could call it mm-hmm. um especially with tommy bolin doing so many different styles of music i mean you don't know what he would have thrown in or come mm-hmm. up with um, it, it could have been uh, because, you know, we were talking, Nate, about um, how he'd done uh, different versions of songs. Like, what, which one was it? It was um, like he did like a reggae version. Of oh, a like, song. like People, People and yeah. uh, Wild Dogs. He did a couple versions of. Yeah, and then he did like a slow version of the song. And it was like one of those type of musicians who did it in like different different versions of it and then one wound up in the album and hearing the other ones are really cool so you don't know if it was gonna like you know there would have been like disco deep purple calypso deep purple like who knows <laughs> <Calypso>. <laughs> like what, what, what influences he would have brought in you don't know i think it would have been really good interesting music that we have come to expect like i think you know at least us being big mark four fans would have loved whatever they came out with because yeah, it would have been I, like I really different, you know. I think uh, I, I compare Tommy Bolin to Jimi Hendrix a lot. I mean, he was very well beyond what most people could do with their instrument. Um, he he really would have was an innovator. I think he would have brought a lot of interesting colors. I think it still would have been rock based, but yeah, I think mm-hmm. there might have been a little more funk, you know, uh, kind of like in Getting Tighter. You had a little bit of a funk feel in, in the middle section there. Yeah, uh, probably would have been maybe more of that, but I think the basis of it would have been rock. But you're right. I think that there would have been all kinds of flavors he would have thrown in there and, you know, maybe taken something from Calypso and turned it into rock. I would Mm -hmm. have loved to hear some of his really cool instrumental sort of jazz fusion-y stuff, but maybe like, like getting tighter, go breaks into that little funk breakdown. I would have loved to hear hear like a little fusion-y elements thrown into songs. I thought that 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 would Mm. be really cool. Yeah. I feel like they would have done like another kind of instrumental kind of like, uh, this uh, this time uh, O to G or this time around, mm. um, but but different. You know what I mean? Like I think they would have had like like the the following album would have had like some some rockers, some kind of um, some kind of those different Tommy Bolin s type of songs, and then maybe like a jazz fusion type of um, instrumental uh, that would have been like some funky Glenn Hughes bass and uh John Lord like wailing away on the organ and stuff like it was great to see those guys like doing different stuff not just sticking with that kind of straight ahead classical stuff that they were just doing like five years earlier mm-hmm. or classical in, in, like infused rock you know what I mean that'd be cool all right next up yeah, we have a question. question from Ryan M another patron favorite I'm sorry I'm, I skipped one. Oh my goodness that was close. From Kev Roberts on Twitter. Why is House of Blue Light so underrated? I love Black and White and Strange Ways in particular. Album never seems to get any affection. I heard Bad Attitude now and then showing up on things. Uh, 
the the song that got ruined for me on that album was uh, Call of the Wild because the video was just horrendous. And it's hard for me to not picture that as a sadly commercial song, even though I know it wasn't written that way. Uh, I don't know. I that, think it's that, sad, that, that song gets a lot of crap. And I wonder if it is mostly because of the video. Probably. I would think it has to be. I mean, it, it's a commercial sounding song for Purple, but they were they weren't sounding a little bit commercial at that time. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a great album, personally. Uh, Spanish Archer is a great song. Missy mm -hmm. Dupree is an excellent blues. Uh, Dead or Alive is a, a great driving song. Um, but it's interesting, coming off of the massive success of Perfect Strangers, that it did do better. But maybe everybody was like, oh my god, Deep Purple's back. Oh yeah, they got another album out. That's cool. It just kind of like, mm -hmm. the excitement was gone in that yeah, moment. Probably. Um... I, I think you're right too. I think the um, at that point the the production got a little more uh, commercial uh, and and the songs too, which ne it wasn't necessarily bad. And Nate, you told me a while ago that I used to talk really favorably about the album when we were younger. I don't remember that, but no, I, I, you, you used to you used to talk very unfavorably about the album. <laughs> oh, unfavorably. Okay, okay. At I don't remember if, that either. Yeah, because I remember bringing that up to you because I, I always remember my first. Uh, memories of that album are you saying ah that album sucks and i was like oh, okay and i i didn't really give it much but then i years later i brought it up to you and you're like i don't remember saying that i like the album so i was like i don't okay, know okay okay maybe it was a misunderstanding or maybe i just made that part up in my head and you were talking crap about some other album i don't know well i think it's i think it's kind of a it was a kind of like a halfway point between like that and like what what scott said too was is that I don't think it's a bad album if you're in the mood for that kind of thing. It's kind of the difference between like 70s Aerosmith and 80s Aerosmith, you know? It's mm -hmm. like if you're in the mood for kind of 80s production, something a little more commercial, like still Deep Purple, but not really Deep Purple, then that, you know, then that would be good. But it's it's just like there's a lot of kind of... Um, I guess like for like again like lack of a better word for like kind of commercial type songs are like just average you know um and after following up perfect strangers everybody's just like yeah yeah they're back and then it was just kind of like anticlimactic then they just have another album and you're like oh another album okay yeah they're just back turning I mean, out albums and and by and at that point like by most accounts they were already just kind of like sick of it you mm -hmm. know they like um it, whether it's true or not that a lot of the performances were phoned in or it wasn't that you know uh inspired i mean even if the songs wound up turning out good you know there was like no kind of fire behind the album so maybe sometimes that shows through but i mean it, it doesn't doesn't really mean anything i mean i've talked a lot about how sometimes if i'm in the mood for like a slick 80s pop album with those keyboards that you hate like i'll <laughs> I'll get into it. But if I'm in the mood to hear like early seventies rock and I'm not in the mood for that other stuff, then that like, that goes to the back of the line, but it doesn't mean I don't like it. It just means I don't like it that day. Yeah. I think, I think uh, perfect strangers is just early enough that they hadn't gotten deep enough into the eighties for the sound to really bother me at least, but by house of blue light, they're full on. I think the keyboard sounds and the drum sounds are kind of a turnoff for me. Um, mm -hmm. I do enjoy the album. I think there's some really good moments for it, but production wise, I, I do struggle with it a little bit, even though I really do like the meat of the album. Mm -hmm. I remember Roger saying something that the, the album was a great advancement in terms of technology for the band because they were kind of stepping into what was available to them. I mean, you've got Ian Pace triggering electronic drums, which had never happened before. And, uh, and on the Perfect Strangers tour, he had said that there was no such animal as electronic drums. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like, they're like, well, you know what? There's other stuff out there. Let's see what it is. Let's see what we can do with it. I think it was a really experimental album. And uh, then, you know, with the production being very uh, commercial and a very specific sound in, in 80s rock, I think it was mm -hmm. just kind of a, a combination of that and people going, okay, well, the, yeah, I'm glad they're back. I'll, I'll check out the album. But that excitement of, oh, my God, there's a, there's a new Deep Purple album was gone. And I think that's very typical of anybody that uh, that does something grandiose. The follow-up is usually not as uh, noticeable. Mm -hmm. And I think in the 70s, people were experimenting with like, let's uh, play with a string section. Let's try out this new Moog synth or whatever it is. In the 80s, and they were just exploring the technology that was available to them. Oh, we'll record eight track, 16 track, whatever. And then by mm -hmm. the 80s, they're like, let's 
you know, we've got 4 million different types of keyboards and these, you know, all of these different ways to mic drums. And I, I don't think the technology was working in anybody's favor in the eighties. Drum samples. Yeah. For mm -hmm. rock music anyway. I think there was a lot of other music that was coming out at that time that did sound really cool and still holds up, but rock music from the eighties, it's, it, it it doesn't hold up that well in, well i mean my, if you, not if, a lot of it does anyway if you take any of the bands from the 70s that had albums around that time it it fits right in with um aerosmith permanent vacation uh kiss crazy nights um just all all bands that around that time if you hear those albums you're like oh that doesn't sound like and then pick that band from say 10 years ago which really was their preferred sound you know and it, it's hard to hear like Aerosmith or, or Kiss or Deep Purple with like um, uh, drum machines or, or drum samples or like the the just kind of that big like fake drum sound or echoey production or slick production or whatever when you're kind of expecting something a little bit different or Jer Judas Priest Turbo is another one mm -hmm. um, which is really like that's way 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 out there like I don't think Purple made that much of a change but I, I would say they're a lot closer to like what Aerosmith did um, with their 80s albums was they still sounded like them but the sound was so like the production and everything and the recording was so updated that it was like it was kind of it was kind of like shocking almost uh, but I mean, the, you know, you can't blame a band for trying to uh, to be current and, and keep up with the times and, uh, you know, stay relevant because otherwise, how are they going to survive? So, yeah, that's that's a really fair point. And, uh, you know, when you walk in and the engineers like I'll take the left and right out from your drum brain and, you know, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's a drum brain. Uh, it's it's going to be a, off to a bad start. I think that there was just a certain way that a lot of stuff in the 80s was expected to sound. So they just made everything sound that way. And mm -hmm. uh, regardless of how good the music was, I think a lot of the, the quality of the music got lost in the production. Definitely. Ryan, good question. Ryan M mm -hmm. on Twitter, once again, for real this time. <laughs> Favorite bands that Deep Purple have shared the stage with. So support acts for Deep Purple. I, I've got. I, I'm cheating a little bit because I do have a complete list here. Oh, cheater! And it is extraordinarily long. Yeah, um, no doubt. But right up at the top, it's in alphabetical order. Aerosmith. Wow. What? Okay. Yeah, that had to be a festival or something. That says in the U.S. in 1974, March 14th and August 26th, and then in, in 1988 again. Why right, are those just one-offs? That wasn't like a tour, though. I get, yeah, it looks like it's just one-offs. Yeah, I would have seen. Oh, okay. I would have seen the '74 one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that, yeah, that would have been great. Guys, that would have been great. What else? Uh, Air Supply, but that was that was a one-off. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is there are so many bands here that I've never heard of. Um, are there any that uh, you know that I would have? Would have liked? Mm, let's see. Just here. by scanning through. Ooh, Billy Preston. I would have liked to see that. Wow. Wow. Beck. What? 2003. <laughs> that, that, yeah, there's a lot of one offs here. Um, I mean, the one that obviously springs to mind for me first is Elf. Um, because, mm. like, they oh, did yeah. have such a long standing, you know, they did the tour in 72, 73, 74, and 75 with them. They toured. Uh, and in 74, they toured UK, US, Canada, and in 75, Germany. Um, so they were one of the probably more prolific um, people to share with Deep Purple. And then Fleetwood Mac, actually, I'm seeing quite a few. That was a, that's kind of sound, for. that's kind of cool. I think that that sounds really like a, like a good lineup for a band. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll say too, just because uh, it's really our only recent experience, the, the band that they played with when we went to see them on their recent tour, uh, Joyous mm -hmm. Wolf, I yep. thought they were really good. I yeah, thought they, they fit in uh, really well with them, like a good young band, kind of like that throwback to like, like when I was just like, yeah, I get it. When I saw them, I'm like, I get it. Like they, yeah. they, they're a young band, but they fit in with what Purple's trying to do. Like it was really almost kind of like a uh, like a like a throwback they were really appropriate um act for it and i thought they were really like good i listened to their album on the way down to the show too so i thought it was pretty pretty good stuff yeah but man yes. that, that, that singer made me feel so old Dang. <laughs> back I mean, he... flipping and just, oh my god he did so many backflips yeah. 
that's that's where they lost me was there was there was way too much hey sing along with me to songs that you've never heard <laughs> and uh and the backflips and stuff but i thought they had some really good writing in a solid rhythm section um, yeah th- and that's, that singer worked yeah. really hard to get to, to whip the crowd up like almost too hard <laughs> you just want to be like yeah. dude it's it's okay man it's good <laughs> yeah i yeah i kind of felt like he was overcompensating a little bit but when you're when you're an unknown band and you're opening for one of the historically biggest bands in ever yeah how do you how do you manage that <laughs> Yeah, that's well, really right. Hard. Exactly. I mean, you know, he's doing backflips, and then Ian Gillen comes out, and he's doing the Elaine Bennis dance. It's like <laughs> you can't you can't compare the two. He's he's got to he's got to pick up all the the extra slack because Ian can't do that stuff anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Uh, I I have to say, uh, as far as favorite openers for me, uh, when I saw uh, Dream Theater and Emerson Lake and Palmer open uh, in the in the late '90s, that was a great show. That was the night I met Roger. And then uh, seeing Edgar Winter and Alice Cooper opening up for Deep Purple a few years ago. Wow. Uh, seeing cool. Alice Cooper open up for Deep Purple, I mean, that's kind of a weird bill because they're, yeah. they're really different acts. But seeing, like, how do you follow Alice Cooper? Yeah, that's... You know, if you've uh, ever seen him live, it's, it's, it's not a, sh- a concert, it's a theatrical performance. Uh, so it's really weird for them to have followed him, but that was a great show. I mean, every time I've seen him has been great, but those were probably opening band wise, probably the best, uh, combination acts that I've seen. Looks like Nazareth did quite a few. Mm. I'd love to see, I'd love to see Nazareth, Uriah Heap, and Deep Purple on a bill together. Well, that'd be great. And did Uriah Heap ever open for them? Let's see. I don't know. I know they shared a rehearsal space in the early seventies. Um, I'm not sure what albums that would be for each band, but I'm thinking it was probably Uriah Heep's first album and maybe Deep Purple and Rock uh, yeah, they, around they, that in, time. In 1970 in the UK, they were apparently known as Spice back then, which I... Oh, know. Spice, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they did a little in the UK and then 72 as well. And then quite a few times since then in the 90s and uh, early aughts. Um, oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, UFO, apparently, another one. Mm. That's well, that sounds for good. them. So quite a, I mean, like I said, there's God, there's so many. Wow, Neil, they played a show with Neil Young in Canada. Wow, 1969. So that was whoa. Oh, really young. okay. Hmm. Wow, lots of lots of wow. great stuff there. Oh, and then of course, uh, should be well. It's actually not listed on here, but uh, well, well, I guess. Oh no, never mind. I was going to say uh, Frank Zappa, but they didn't actually play a show together. They were just going to see his show. Right. And that didn't work out. No, it didn't work um, out so well. <laughs> now, I do remember uh, when Purple was on Rockline and somebody had asked who was their favorite supporting act. I think the final uh, choice for them was Iron Maiden, that hmm. they had the most fun with Iron Maiden. Yeah, that makes sense. But that would have been back like Perfect Strangers era when that, when that aired. You know, that, that seems to make a lot of sense because they're, they're really uh, similar types of music. It's like uh, Purple is almost like the predecessor to their, their type of uh, metal that they were playing at that time. Yeah. Yeah, that so, would have been a good show to see. Yeah. All right. Steve Hunt on Twitter asks, what if the rising lineup of Rainbow had stayed together? Could they have been as big as Deep Purple? What if Ian Gillen had accepted Blackmore's offer to join Rainbow in 79? You would have had Richie, Ian, and Roger in Rainbow, and then David, John, and Ian in Whitesnake. How awesome would that have been? That would have been awesome. <laughs> but I think, I think the, uh, the answer to Ian accepting Richie's offer to join Rainbow is just like, what, <laughs> what the hell was Richie thinking? And uh, all right, I mean, well, how okay. long would I guess the question is there would have been a, they probably the band themselves, the other three guys would have had a pool. Okay, how long is this going to go on, guys? <laughs> Before one of them uh, cracks or spaghetti's flying into somebody's face, we got to put down some dates. I well, want to know how many pints of mead had been consumed before <laughs> that offer was made. <laughs> <laughs> Much me, many flagons of mead had been consumed. <laughs> I, I think the the thing is now what what time frame was that before Graham Bonnet or was that before Jolyn Turner? I think it would have been oh. before Graham Bonnet. Yeah, because like when Graham Bonnet was left. after Dio, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. So, so Dio left, and they were like, "Oh, I know who we can get to replace Dio. How about my See, good old friend Ian Gillen?" 
<laughs> Richie was heading really towards a more commercial sound, starting with Down to Earth with right. Rainbow. Yeah. So I don't really know that Gillen would have worked out with that kind of music anyway. He was coming too, off of like hard. he was coming off of all this like jazz fusion, uh, completely out there stuff, and just be like, oh yeah, right. I'm, I'm really commercial. Yeah, but I, I guess don't, he, I don't he knew what Gillen worked. and Glover together would have been capable of. And I guess that that's where it makes a lot of sense is bringing Glover yeah. in to bring Gillen in as well. Mm -hmm. That's true, well, especially if, if, if Glover was already back in at that point, because uh, I know it was around Rising when he reconnected with Richie, uh, just because they happened to be in the studio at the same time. So he played uh, Rising for Roger, and was, Roger was impressed. But he wasn't. He was just brought on to Down to Earth to be a producer originally, as I understand it. And they just couldn't find a bass player. And he's like, "All right, fine, I'll do it." Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I yeah. think the more interesting part of the question is: is like, what would have happened if the Rising um, lineup uh, kept going? And I would say, notwithstanding like the actual stuff that happened, which is like upsets me a lot, uh, that Ronnie. And I think it wasn't Ronnie and Richie who weren't really crazy about the whole album and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, like, let's just put all that aside. But if they had like stayed together and they had done like a couple of more albums, I think it would have been tremendous. Like, I, I could probably see that lineup being together for like maybe three albums total. I don't like that's just the sense that I get. But I think they could have like gone into the late seventies, early eighties, doing like some really like great. Um, like kind of proto power metal type stuff. Because mm -hmm. I mean, and, that's really what Rising was. Well, that, and that's Blackmore's probably main fault, at least at this point, is he never, he, he always wants to mix things up and he'll be the first one to admit that. Yeah. But, but at the same time, he never lets a band get enough experience or time together to, to, to see what it's really capable of. Black, Rainbow mm -hmm. just was never, just, never stopped changing and i guess the jlt era is probably the longest uh or, or the most consistent line but here band. but here's the way that i think yeah. about it is, is they have um deep purple has um in rock um fireball um, and machine head which and the one that you don't like <laughs> no but i'm no but i'm saying those three albums together like th those three not like withstanding like you know the who do we think we are concerto before it just those three i think are the most like consistent albums like you could like i could listen to any one of them maybe in rock has a little um has a little less production on it but those three albums are all like really consistent and i feel like if he was that consistent with like the um the rising version of rainbow um then I think they could have made like three like uh solid uh metal albums. I think really I mean that one is just influential enough and like just fantastic. It was probably the the best rainbow album um in my opinion um mm -hmm. from the from the early lineups because I mean each one was different. I mean you had the first one which was kind of a mishmash and then the um long live rock and roll which we found out even though it was good was really kind of a, a mishmash of stuff um i didn't even know richie played bass on most of it mm -hmm. and then you had all the kind of commercial stuff kind of um you know coming after it um which i mean it's all really good stuff but i mean for that place that they were in for rising if they had just kind of stayed in there for like a few years like i, I think it would have been tremendous yeah, I would agree with that. And I, I think that, that there then becomes the pressure once you've created an album that you know is going to be iconic, was very popular with people. What you do next has so much more attention because the expectation now is there. And I feel like uh, Long Live Rock and Roll, while it's a great album, was really a step back from the intensity of Rising. I mean, Rising was just full force from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. And uh I almost look at Kill the King the same way I do Man on the Silver Mountain. Like the album version was okay, but it was really the live version that made that song powerful. But with Rising, the power was in the album itself. And I think that was a really magical thing. So mm -hmm. considering that most of that lineup created uh, Long Live Rock and Roll, I think that they would have struggled to make the next album after that to find what their space was, what, who they wanted to define themselves as next. All right, yeah, Steve, true. Steve Hunt on Facebook. Well, he asked those two questions on Twitter. Same Steve Hunt on Facebook asks, what if Blackmore, Turner, and Glover kept Rainbow going 
in the 80s. So Deep Purple doesn't get back together. And mm -hmm. uh, Rainbow continues with uh, JLT, Glover, and Blackmore. I think they would have been really comfortable going through the 80s. I think they probably would have been successful. I mean, I don't think that Richie stopped Rainbow because they weren't doing anything. I think he just wanted to – he had the opportunity to go back to Purple. And yeah, so wasn't the did. story that basically they made him an offer he couldn't really – I think it's that part or it's either that or when they asked him to stay later on mm -hmm. where they just like, Hey, what would it take to get you to be in deep purple? And he's like, I don't know, a million dollars. And they're like, okay. And he's like, Oh shit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was, that, that was for the battle rages on. Oh, okay. That was, right. that was to stay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I think, I think he saw an opportunity uh, with, with the Mark II lineup getting back together because that had been so successful. Um, and they turned out some good stuff musically. Uh, I think the original intent was that he was putting rainbow on hiatus until he found out where the purple thing went. And then when he said, okay, it's time to make rainbow again, he's like, I'll just get all new guys. I'm, I'm not going to go back to that. You yeah. know what I had, but I think, I think they were in a really good place uh, doing straight between the eyes and then bent out of shape. I think they were on a really good train. They were writing good songs. The sound was good. They were popular. I think that they would have cranked out a, a, a few good albums. Yeah. I definitely yeah. think they would have sailed through the, the mid to late eighties, still making some great albums and then probably died out in the early nineties. Would have been great if they tried to like, like go to the grunge phase, like in the grunge early, rainbow. <laughs> nine, 1992. They, they have like a rainbow, but it's all like shades of gray. <laughs> I'm just going to write depressing songs with really low lyrics. Would have been Richie great. has a, f a flannel, like a flannel um, uh, hat. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't throw his guitar up in the air he just sets it down and walks away and looks at it longingly like a, fl a flannel pilgrim a fl hat a flannel pilgrim <laughs> hat he plays everything in drop d tuning you know <laughs> and no one else does well, i guess you know, steve we... hunt steve hunt didn't ask about the 90s only the 80s so i guess i guess we'll have uh, to leave it there uh, uh, well they would have made it yeah, yeah I, I think it, th it would have been successful even while that kind of production and everything wasn't necessarily my cup of tea. I think the, if he had had that lineup continue to build, because he really only had two JLT albums, because Difficult to Cure, while it was a JLT album, was all written without him. Uh, well, mostly mm -hmm. written without him. He kind of came right. in almost after the fact um, when Graham Bonnet wasn't decided he didn't want to continue. So, um, yeah, you again once again you've got this lineup that doesn't stick together for very long you're talking from 81 mm -hmm. to 83 essentially mm -hmm. very short yeah. time. Two, but two if they stay years. together i mean the the songs the production jlt's vocals it all fit in with that 80s uh commercial pop mold and i think um you know that was his wheel like jlt could have been could have stuck within the whole he could do anything you know but um because he was um he was a great vocalist um like particularly if you're talking about that era like that's the kind of vocalist that you wanted to hear then so mm -hmm. and he's still good yeah yeah oh definitely i would agree with that okay next question comes to us from purple blackers on instagram and it is was this time around material from sarah band um was this time around material from Sarah band that Glenn wasn't supposed to hear. So um, this time around, so, you know, a little background, John Lord's playing the piano in the, in the studio and Glenn's like, Ooh, what's that? And then boom, they collaborate and bang this out. So this question I guess is, was, was that John working on some material for Sarah band that Glenn wasn't supposed to hear? He heard it. And then John said, Oh crap, I guess he's going to have to. <laughs> <laughs> sing this now and i'll keep the rest of it secret for i like that idea <laughs> well, well, like, what do we know um i don't i i don't know uh but i, I like i got nothing I, i'm glad it worked out the way it did though because that's a fantastic uh song for come taste the band it's one of my favorites mm -hmm. it is uh as, as you may know my favorite deep purple song and that's right uh, it's uh and ray fenwick's as well hey we got that in college. yes i really i was that really excited me when he said that I'm <laughs> I like, know, that's me, a great thing me too i was like, i didn't want to interrupt him but i was like oh it's my favorite song too <laughs> <laughs> like a, like a like a giddy little schoolgirl. um <laughs> that was a great interview by the way i really love that 
Oh yeah, it was God. It was so so much fun talking to him. He's a great guy. Mm -hmm. Um, such a nice guy too. Jeez. Mm -hmm. He asked me for my address the other day. He's like, I'm gonna send you something in the mail. I was like, awesome. I don't care. It could be his old oh. socks. I'm. I'm like, <laughs> the fact the fact that he's gonna take time out of his day to send send us something. Awesome. That's pretty cool. I hope it's Rod Evans. <laughs> it's how big is the box the box it's moving <laughs> i was what? gonna say the yellow, the yellow suit that he was wearing in the <laughs> oh <laughs> oh my goodness now i'm gonna be disappointed no matter what he's oh what's this <laughs> like oh a cd mm. uh, unreleased material that no one's ever heard uh, <laughs> yawn i wanted the yellow i wanted rod evans dressed in the yellow suit <laughs> Actually, if it's if it's, um, if it's if it's if it's if it's a performance of uh, his band doing um, the uh, Child in Time, and then um, oh yeah, this time mm -hmm. around that would be awesome. I would love to hear that. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. we'll have to play that on the show if it is. Anyway, right, um, pressure's but, on, right? But with Sarah Band, I, I could see this time around fitting into that kind of groove, or having maybe a little bit more of a like a kind of dave brubeck feel to it or something um playing that the, playing those chords but um it's possible it's very possible it's something he was working on we will never yeah. know yeah hmm. um deep rainbow snack on twitter says <laughs> i love these names you guys have to talk about the Babyface project it's true we do yes the i wanted to hear that i know I remember in the mid nineties being on highway star and other like geo city sites or whatever, and just finding out, Oh, this baby face project. And at the time not being sure thinking, Oh my God, there were albums that this power trio had done. And I can't believe it. Phil Linen and uh, Blackmore and pace. Like I've got to hear this. I've got to hear this. And, searching the web and not being able to find anything of course because nothing was ever released um but apparently they say that the tapes exist just nobody knows where they are or they might be in ian pace's collection of junk that he's going through wouldn't that be great he's got this new youtube channel if he just was let, released oh by the way here's <laughs> some of the babyface project i think the world oh. would explode if he did that at least our world it's it's funny that you say that because as soon as he talked in one of the videos about, you know, we're going through footage and seeing what we think would be releasable. I'm like, the first thing that came to my mind was baby face. I'm like, please, please, I will pay you to mix it down. I don't care. Let's just get, let's get that hurt. Well, I think the, uh, the, the sad part is I, I think we'd probably be pretty underwhelming. <laughs> well, I think it would be interesting though, just to hear it. Cause they were really just like feeling their way around. So it's not like they were recording finished songs, mm -hmm. but just, just hearing how they interacted together because Phil was not the greatest bass player at that mm -hmm. time. So I would just be curious to hear what the sound was like and where it was headed more and than did he, And did he do any vocals or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be, I would be, I would be happy to hear any, any of that. So that'd be yeah. Cool. All right, so that wraps up the proper questions, but now we have what is known in the business as the Peter Gardot lightning round. Oh, Ooh. boy. Peter sent... <laughs> here we go. Via email, sent a list of questions. So Of course he did. <laughs> <laughs> only, oh, Peter. Only some of them having anything to do with Deep Purple. <laughs> And, and some I, of them have to do with Caldor by any chance? Or? Uh, the first one, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, I'm good. Unfortunately, unless some of these retail chains were, um, some of these are going to be a little lost on you, Scott. Just a couple of them, but it's a lightning round, so it shouldn't be too bad. That's um, right, I'm used to it. <laughs> so, some New England specific stuff. So, um, Question number one, Strawberries, Zare, Caldor, Newberry Comics, or other places are the best place to get new stuff in the 80s and 90s? Oh, you have, um, John. What, like which one? Yeah, we, 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 what would be your preferred retail establishment for getting new CDs in the 80s and 90s? Oh, um, I mean, I was... Tape, tapes and CDs, I guess. I mean, out of all those, I went to, um, I went to um, Strawberries and Newberry Comics. Newberry Comics more in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I don't think like the, the other things, and I like the stuff that was in the in the mall was like um 
it was FYE, but it was something before that. I think it was, it was called like Tape World or something. <laughs> oh, yeah. I you remember that's, that? That's where I got um, the first Rainbow album. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They had like, there was a place called like Lincoln Tape. Lincoln Mall, right? Um, yeah, Lincoln, Lincoln Mall, Warwick Mall, Tape World. There was this other place too, um, which was across from the mall. And it was this place uh, across from Warwick Mall called Sam's. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. It was like a little record store, and then there was a. It was it was kind of like. Um, That's where I got the first like, Blackmore's Night album when it was released. Yeah, independent places. So there were these two places like right next door to each other, and there's one place, Sam's, which was just like you walked in, and it was just it was one of those places where it seemed like the ceiling was caving in on you with like <laughs> CDs and cassettes and everything, and there was this guy who was up on a podium, and he had a big Bob yeah, Ross big, afro. A big. <laughs> <laughs> And he was always seemed like he was in a bad mood, but not only did he have things like on the release dates, but it was at least two or $3 cheaper than the mall. And he had all the Japanese imports for like purple stuff, which. And you go in and you just be like, Oh, do you have the new Dio? And he'd just be like next week, (laughs) you know, like, he's like, I don't need your fucking business, you know? And then, (laughs) and then, (laughs) And then, you know, a scared 16-year-old me with a jean jacket would run out and go next door to this place called Rock City, uh, which had uh, posters and collectibles and um, like t-shirts and stuff. So they didn't sell, like that one place, they sold just the tapes and this place next door sold like the memorabilia. And I could still picture it in my head, but I can't remember for the life of me if it was like real like memorabilia or if it was just kind of like like crap you know like spencer's type crap but mm-hmm. um but anyway those were definitely my preferred places and then of course going to the mall because i would scour any record stores um uh there was one in the emerald mall too nate but i can't remember the name of it mm-hmm. i just remember like the pink neon sign uh I don't but anyways what about you scott where did you get your uh your stuff in the 80s and 90s well, I feel like I'm really missing out now. That sounded like a really cool place to go <laughs> hang out. Uh, we had we had a couple of independent stores that uh, we had one that uh, I can't remember the name of it, but they rounded their prices so that everything came out to an even dollar, which oh. was nice. And they had a lot nice. of uh, rarities there in that store. Uh, and this was a great time because back then we didn't have the internet. So we had to get a book that would show you all the records that had been released and hope that they got them all right. <laughs> and uh, so you could find out what, what was out. And uh, we used to go to record shows uh, that, that would come around. But uh, there was a chain called Harmony House in Michigan, where I grew up uh, just outside Detroit at the McComb Mall. And that was pretty much where uh, we would go to get everything. And then, uh, you know, if, if a new album was coming out, we would call and have a copy reserved or, uh, you know, do a special, special orders for some of the things that they could get a hold of. But, uh, yeah, it was just the one giant record store in the mall. All right. Oh, cool. I'd say of, hey. of the things that Peter sent, Newberry Comics would probably be my favorite, but also mm-hmm. Sam's, like John said. And then we would drive up to Boston to go to Tower Records every so often. And then there was mm. also a really good, um, some really good bookstores up there that had all the imports from uh, the UK, which was really good. Nice. Yeah. All right, lightning round question number two, the Gardo lightning round, sponsored by Peter Gardo. <laughs> uh, number two, your father's feet or your father's back? <laughs> uh back john feet are back death (laughs) (laughs) oh geez i don't know is there a panic button to this uh quiz i don't know what we're doing with the feet or the back but i'm gonna go with i'm gonna go with feet oh i don't know you know what unless it's touching them in which case i'll probably go with back probably back because when i was a kid my my dad would hurt his back and he would ask me to like rub his back (laughs) Um, he would he would frequently say like uh, he would say kiss my feet and I'd be like yeah over my dead body. <laughs> he was joking, but I was like just the thought of it made me recoil. So fair enough. <laughs> All right, question just number no th- <laughs> question number three. And this is very uh, very Rhode Island specific, so I apologize. Mesquamacet Beach or Watch Hill Beach or other? John. Other. Other. Yeah, oh, second beach second beach yeah that's in um that's in um um not newport what's the town next one i always forget Narragansett. no middletown middletown that's it yeah second beach middletown it's one of my favorites 
I don't know. I, I'm going to select other. <laughs> I, I've never Surprise. been there. Uh, and I'm writing in Newport Beach because that's where I go uh, one day before him. Ah, nice. there you go. Nice. I'm going to go with mm-hmm. Musquamacate because I feel like if you're in Rhode Island, it has to be a beach that has a Native American name. Mm-hmm. And then also Watch Hill. I mean, come on. That's where all like the that's where all the real rich uh, people go. And it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm a man of the people. So I'm a Musquamacate <laughs> sort, of, sort of guy. <laughs> Um, number four, best show at Great Woods or Tweeter Center or whatever it is now. <laughs> so this was a big uh, outdoor venue. For, this was like the place in the area we grew up to, to go see the big bands when they came around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, went through a lot of different names. I remember when they changed the name of it to the Tweeter Center. We were like, <laughs> Tweeter, you know, <laughs> Tweeter. Because I don't know, because I don't know why it sounded funny, but it's because it's like, what a goofy name, you know? It's like when they changed the Providence Civic Center to the Dunkin' Donuts Center. We're like, oh come on, really? The Dunk. <laughs> but I mean, now funny. it's My, like a band I was in. The first show we ever played was at the uh, at the Dunkin' Donuts Center. Yeah. So we like we were like I remember the singer was like, I got our first gig. It's it's at the Dunkin' Donut Center. And I was like, really? This is like, you know, a, a place that seats like fifteen thousand people. <laughs> so, oh, wow. So, so I was just very um very confused about how we could possibly have gotten this gig. But it was some weird thing where it was like they had set up all these skateboard ramps and we were just like kind of the band back backing it up. So it was it wasn't like we were pay- playing to 15,000 people. Right. Um, um, I've, I've seen a lot of great shows there over the years. Um, God, uh, just a couple that come to mind is, um, I, I mean, I know I've seen Aerosmith there. Mm-hmm. Um, they were really great. Um, when, before they started, like, it was a regular thing, like the, the summer, like, tour with Poison, you know, and they kind of got back together and did like the, the the hair metal thing before it was like cool again, you know, and they were just kind of like reuniting before it became like, it was kind of semi-retro. I think it was like, like them, Winger, you know, some other bands like that, which I, I thought it was really cool. I remember having a great time at that. And I saw it, I did see Aerosmith there multiple times. Um, and I think I went to like a Ozfest. I think, I can't remember. Somebody might've like dragged me along. Because it's not really, except for Ozzy, not really my scene. Yeah, I know I've been there many times. The only one I can remember, though, is what I've talked about on the show, is going with you to see B.B. Uh, King there. That's the only yep. one that jumps out at me. That was, a, that was a good one. You know what? Come to think of it, um, I did see Deep Purple there. Now that I, I, like, I can't remember what tour it was, but it was definitely, I really? just remember, like, uh, it was maybe early, early 2000s. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I did see them back then. And I just remember Ian Gillen coming out and his, like, and I wasn't ready for it. Like his hair was short. He was wearing like all white. Like he looked like he just like came back from like the friggin' beach or something. He had on yeah. like, sandals or whatever. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? Like, <laughs> I wasn't into it. But, um, but I, I don't know if, um. Yeah, I, I I still have my ticket stub saved. So I mean, I could see what year it's from, even because I saved all of my physical ticket stubs. Yeah, we need we need you to follow follow up with us on uh, on what exactly which tour that was. Scott, what was the big venue in in Michigan where you would go see folks? Uh, that would be Joe Louis Arena, which ah. is where the uh, Detroit Red Wings played. Um, first concert I saw there was Deep Purple and Girls School. Uh, I saw Alice Cooper there on the Raise Your Fist and Yell tour with Fraley's Comet opening, mm-hmm. yes. uh, which was pretty interesting. Nice. Uh, I did not know at the time that Kip Winger was the bass player for Alice Cooper. Nice. And uh, that was a great show. And, it was, and that was on Halloween night. Oh, oh that's cool. Alice Cooper on yeah. Halloween. That's like a, oof, you can't beat that. Yeah. No, that Kip was Kip Winger was on awesome. bass. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know he was heading for a heartbreak. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, growing up, that was that was the venue. But those were the only two. Uh, oh, and I saw Deep Purple with um, uh, on House of Blue Light, but I can't remember who was opening. Maybe that was Fraley's Comet. Um, no, that was Bad Company. Uh, Bad Company opened for Deep Purple on that tour. Nice. Yeah, so a couple good shows there, anyway. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm consulting the list. I don't see Fraley's comment, so you're right. Um, okay. Nah. Uh, next up, uh, sorry, uh, I think this is the last Rhode Island <laughs> centered one. <laughs> did you did you ever see a show at Lupo's Heartbreak Hotel in Providence, John? Um, yes. <laughs> the the oh man, oh, this is so long ago. I. The only one that really comes to mind, like, is was uh, Little Richard. You saw Little Richard? Yeah. Wow. How was that live? Yeah, he was. Um, yeah, he was something else. And we're talking like Little Richard in a club. And I remember, yeah. like, the the mayor. I think it was. I think Buddy Cianci was like uh, gave him the <laughs> no. key to the city. Wow. Of course, he had to find and figure out a way to make it all about him. Let me <laughs> get up on stage and present Little Richard with the. And oh, and actually, I, like there is somewhere I I had a, a newspaper clipping of it because you know you had little Richard with like at that time he had the, you know the big hair thing and then you had Cianci who had the hair piece and he was holding he was handing him the key and you know everything. I think I also saw, <laughs> on the other end of the spectrum, I think I saw Anthrax there too. <laughs> really, <laughs> that's a little Richard and Anthrax. What a bill. No, that they weren't on the same bill. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, no, two do you, separate bills. Do you know uh, Buddy Cianci? I do not. He has. Was he has. The mayor? Yeah, he was the mayor, yeah. the super corrupt mayor of Providence. Who had he had national. Uh, he made national headlines from being so corrupt. But he, everybody oh. in Rhode Island loved him. Yeah, he he and he did for <laughs> the city got immensely better with him as the mayor you can't really deny it unfortunately but he yeah. was the mayor then he like spent some time in prison then got elected mayor again <laughs> and um he is a uh, little known fact the only person uh that i am not related to that i have spent christmas with really this back when i used to um do catering i i catered his christmas uh dinner wow yeah and, and i and just sat there seething and annoyed that i had to be at his house on christmas day it was horrible uh it, i mean it would have been a lot nicer if he was not the world's most like cruel and mean person right <laughs> he was just he was just a very nasty guy it was sad um how about you nate um uh yeah um yes i will take it to the next level not only have i seen a show at lupo's heartbreak hotel i have played shows at the Lupo, Lupo's Heartbreak Hotel. Ooh, mm -hmm. so, nice. Um, and I was uh, not headed for a heartbreak. And what about <laughs> um, non-Rhode non Island, since we're throwing these to at Scott too, is there a, like a kind of a, like a, a club place, like an old, old theater or like a, you know, kind of a, one of those dive type music places that you would see, um, you know, big bands at they had in your hometown? Or <laughs> yeah, every, time uh, you say, every time you say big bands, I think like, <laughs> A big band, like no, Dizzy Gillespie. Like... Or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did you see Dizzy Gillespie at the uh, Lupos? I, I did not, but I I did find out that my great uncle Richie used to play with Benny Goodman whenever he would come to Ohio. Oh, I don't know how often Benny Goodman would come to Ohio, but apparently oh. he would call my my uh, great uncle Richie and, and to jam with him. Uh, yeah, I, I, not in Detroit, because I left, um, that was a city that you really didn't go out unless you, you know, at night, unless you really wanted to. <laughs> so I was a little bit young when we left there, so I didn't get to see any bands like that mm -hmm. there. Um, uh, in Colorado, I probably did, but nothing's coming to mind. I know that Dio played a little club called the Rack and Roll, which was like a pool hall with a small wow. stage that my friends would play at sometimes. And, and I did not wow. know until the next day that he was there. I was so bummed. Oh, Oh man, so bummed. That would have been that was that was wild. Um, and, and so, an intimate setting like that would have been an awesome place to see him play. Well, I can I guess I would like one one up that by it's not on the the questionnaire, but I've seen uh, several shows at the um, at the station, which I'm sure everybody's heard mm -hmm. of. Yeah. Um, you know, of course, before, um, you know the the tragedy, but I actually saw some pretty pretty decent shows there i saw i saw wasp there for the first time wow that and that was wild so just imagine because when you said a pool hall with the stage on it i mean that's basically what that place was i just remember going in there and thinking like this place looks like it's a restaurant by day and then they just like have like you know you can have like some guy like you know playing like an acoustic guitar up there on the stage that's how tiny this place was and i remember 
I definitely, I don't know who else I saw that, but I definitely remember seeing Wasp there and just being like, holy shit, I was like blown away. And that was like late 90s. Mm-hmm. Well, when I saw Gillen's Inn, it was at this place in Arizona called the venue of Scottsdale. And uh, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's almost like these old, like uh, cobblestone streets. And it's, it's just kind of one and the stages at the end and then they have shops and stuff. Uh, but that was a very intimate setting. And uh, nice. I really didn't know what to expect for a solo tour from him. Uh, but the, it was packed, absolutely packed, and uh, and a great show. But I I love seeing bands in the big arenas. I love seeing them get the the crowds that they deserve. But I really mm-hmm. kind of like those intimate settings. Even the House yeah. of Blues here is not that big, uh, mm-hmm. where I just walked right up and I was at the front of the stage for the whole show. Yeah, I agree. I, I really enjoy the the more intimate venues as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. All right. Next question, number six, chock full of nuts or Sanka? <laughs> Sanka's instant, isn't it? You guys don't even drink coffee. No, no I don't. don't. No. I don't uh, know. But when Dude, I did, I think I would, I would go for chock full of nuts. I, well, I, I, in fact, I had gone for chock full of nuts. Yeah, dealer's I, choice, whatever, whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a big coffee drinker. I haven't had Sanka in uh, probably two or three decades. So I would give Chock Full of Nuts a whirl. Yeah, I feel like Sanka is like the kind of Italian household staple. I'm sure it was around my parents' house. So Yeah, I just mm-hmm. always, yeah. I'll, I'll go. I guess I'll go with Sanka. Hey, you want some Sanka? <laughs> <laughs> when you're not even calling it coffee, that says it all. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's always you want some Sanka, yeah. Who wants some Sanka? <laughs> Yeah, no one says, hey, who wants some Maxwell House? They're like, who wants coffee? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Maxwell House doesn't have the same clout as Sanka. You just want to be Apparently sure. Apparently not, off. yeah. Hey guys, I have Sanka, <laughs> all right? I don't know if you know this. Yeah, you better have tickets. Okay, Gardo, lightning round question number seven. If the president nominated JoLynn Turner for the post of United States Rock and Roll <laughs> Protector, would you object? <laughs> I don't know what a Rock and Roll Protector <laughs> means exactly. Is it like the Space um, Force, but for music? Nah, sure. <laughs> I would say it's probably the, I would say it's the, the coolest thing that, that the president has done, and I would vote for it. <laughs> vote for, well, I guess you couldn't vote for it. It would just happen. You just, or I would be, just, I would be in favor of it. I'd give it the thumbs up. I'd be, be like, like pro- all right. So is it, is it someone to protect, like, the le- like just pro- keep rock and roll alive and make sure it flourishes? Sure, I mean, this- I mean, there's a lot worse choices, you know? I mean, he could have said, like, uh, I don't know, that guy from Sugar Ray or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, with the, with the great sponsorship that Joe Lynn Turner has given the Deep Purple podcast, how do you not get behind a guy that can sing, you know, a song about a toy and then a song about cereal and then a song about, you know, like, Depends Undergarments and just go from one to another so brilliantly and flawlessly? How do you not get behind? Yeah, we're kind of, we're kind of locked in. We have to we have to support our our corporate overlord. <laughs> That's right. Gardo, lightning round question number eight: If Carlos Santana replaced Richie Blackmore in Deep Purple in 1994, would they have renamed the band Deep Santana or Purple Santana? Would it have worked? <laughs> what do you think, <laughs> John? I'm gonna let you take this one first. <laughs> oh. As these questions go off the rails. <laughs> yeah, this is totally off the rails. That actually sounds really kind of interesting because like in the the early 90s, like Santana was kind of, he was kind of hot again, you know? He oh yeah, like, well, he, came, he was doing yeah. smooth and like, you know, he was um, kind of commercial and everything. I think he would have fit in, um, oddly enough. Like, I think it would have been a weird, like, kind of like six months Satriani kind of deal. That would have been like, you know. And and, like, and Gillen could have brought the congas back out and yes, you know they could have called it you know Deep Purple Mark Siete or something like <laughs> I don't know, um, yeah um, I don't know what did he what did he say Deep Deep, deep Santana. Santana or Purple Santana I like it it has to end with Santana right about, yeah what about Carlos Purple <laughs> I think Purple Santana sounds kind of filthy I don't know. Why. <laughs> Well, so does Deep Carlos. <laughs> uh, I, I, I go purple Santana just because, like, I don't know. That's that's where I'm headed for no apparent reason. Uh, it could be like uh, uh, Car- Carlos Morado or something. I don't uh, know. There's a lot you know, of different... 
Carlos has a residency at the House of Blues here in Vegas, and okay. uh, I, w I went down to see it. And uh, sad to say, it was one of the only shows I've ever walked out of. Really? Um, part of it was because the, uh, the mix was terrible. All the percussion was drowning out the guitar, so you couldn't really hear what Carlos was doing anyway. Yeah. But the, it, was, it was more of a, just like a jam than a, an actual show. They weren't really playing songs so much as just oh. playing. Mm. And it's a, that, a big you know, drum circle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's, it's like you can do that, I guess, a little bit during the shows, but it kind of needed a little bit of structure and I just got bored and left. Uh, I, man, I mean, I don't know. The, the closest I would think that they ever got to that would be a song called Doing It Tonight, which was on the Bananas album, uh, which is a little bit down the line from where you guys are at. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a little bit uh, islandish. I want to say it's like a rock version of island music, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I can't hear that any more than I could hear Paul Rogers singing with the band. Yeah, that would be a tough. So I, 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 I'll go with deep, deep Santana. All right, excellent choice. <laughs> and the final Gardo lightning round question. I like how a lightning round hasn't really been that lightning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah not. Well, these are just kind of like really hit you in the. Hit you they the hit, you, they hit you like lightning, but they're not fast like lightning. All right, well, number nine. My favorite one so far, right there. Is there a link like to Benny Goodman Band <laughs> in Clear Turbulence to Frank Zappa at all? I've been thinking about it. Oh, just figured it out. Yeah, Steve Vai via Coverdale. Uh, uh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> It was more of a statement. <laughs> well, he started asking the question and then realized that he had he had an answer. But can you? I, li guys... I like how he still sent it. <laughs> yeah, like he didn't hit delete. You know, that's good. I don't know what Peter's on, but I'll have twenty dollars worth. Peter's Peter's emails are always a lot of fun. Um, yeah. All right. So, well, there's got to be other uh, connections to Zappa. Any any can think of any other ones. What Deep Purple and yeah, like uh, any other links to Deep Purple, like this Besi Vi besides one. besides Vi. Um, I don't know Zappa that well, so I don't know. Well, there's also uh, Ainsley uh, Dunsbar, uh, Ainsley Dunsbar, <laughs> Ainsley oh, Dunbar. Uh, another he, he played with Zappa. Yeah, I didn't know that. Oh wow. Yeah, quite a quite a quite a bit actually. And he uh, he was the drummer on the White Snake '87 album, right? Mm-hmm. The only other one that's really jumping out at me is Eddie Jobson, uh, who played a lot with Zappa, and he was, of course, on Butterfly Ball. Mm. Um, uh, there, I, I'm sure there's a, a bunch of other connections other than the Smoke on the Water connection, but I, I can't think of them off the top of my head. I wonder, did, did Zappa on the uh, list of gigs, did they ever play with him? Uh, no, they did play with Dweezil, though. Mm. Just Dweezil. Uh, well, you recently. take what you can get. And they were scheduled to play with Dweezil this summer, but it got canceled. Oh, wow. Huh. I'm a big Dweezil Zappa fan. But he used anyway. to have his own uh, phone line that you could call into and, and you could uh, leave a message for him and he would uh, call you back or something. Uh, remember <laughs> in, the, in the 80s and like into the early 90s when they had phone lines for bands and you yeah, could yeah. call in and pay like $1.25 a yes. minute to hear their message and stuff. Yeah, he had one of those lines. Hmm. I would, I, if I had known at the time, I probably would have called. Oh, sure. But, oh, all right. Well, that, that wraps it up for these, this uh, first roundtable discussion on all these questions. Yeah, wow, lots of, lots of questions. A lot of great questions. Yeah. Um, and if you have any reasons why our answers were totally bogus, let us know. We'd love to hear them. We'd love to hear why we're bogus. Um, in, in our speculation of non-reality. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You're wrong. That's not what would have happened. <laughs> but, but also there were, other, there were other things, like if anybody knows the, the story behind Richie's scar. Yeah, yeah, or the or the business uh, operations of Deep Purple. Let us know. Yeah, can like factual questions as a, as a little um, uh, update or addendum on a future episode. But Scott, you're like the, I, thank you so much I, for stopping by and joining us. Yeah, uh, thank you guys. And I had a lot of fun. And I would say, yeah, this was fun. People are are writing in their rebuttals. Uh, <laughs> let's just all agree on one thing: Rainbow would have happened. Yes. So let's just <laughs> let's just cut that out right there. 
It's like, what if Rainbow had not gone to the studio in May of 1975? Eh, probably would have been in August. Then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you could have pushed it off too far. Yeah. What if, what if Richie would have become fascinated with the accordion? What would have happened to Rainbow? <laughs> they just would have done Black Sheep of the Family with an accordion. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah, they, would have, they would have been playing Oktoberfest in Germany and Munich. and Yeah. That's it. There you That's go. Right. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, thank you guys so much. And, yeah, yeah. Well, th- thank yeah. This was for... a fun roundtable discussion. Yeah, this is for we sure. got to do it again. Yeah, for yeah, sure. I, yeah. Anytime, guys. I'm up for it. All right. Awesome. We can't wait. Well, thank you so much, and we will see you again next week. Thank you for listening to the Deep Purple Podcast. If you like what you hear and would like more episodes in the future, please donate on Patreon to support the show. You can also give us a rating on iTunes to help new people discover the show. You can follow us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook for show updates. See deeppurplepodcast.com for more details. Thank you for listening.